Next, a congressional hearing on alleged waste and mismanagement in the federal public housing system. The House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing held this hearing on Thursday to investigate a variety of reported problems in the public housing systems of Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. Subcommittee members focused on reports concerning millions of dollars in federal money spent on operating subsidies for housing units that are actually closed down or even demolished. The first witness we will hear from will be the Inspector General's Office at the Department of Housing and Urban Development representative. That agency produced some of those reports. The panel also heard from residents of public housing units in Philadelphia and Washington, as well as officials from the public housing authorities in both cities. You will now see Thursday's proceedings gavel to order by the subcommittee chairman, Tom Lantos, a California Democrat. Subcommittee on Employment and Housing will please come to order. Two years ago, this subcommittee held hearings to examine abuses in the administration of the Passaic New Jersey Housing Authority. We found a shocking pattern of abuses, including the executive director receiving in excess of a quarter of a million dollars for simultaneously holding four HUD finance jobs, two full-time and two part-time positions. The deputy executive director also being paid for multiple jobs. And the housing commission asleep at the helm, rubber stamping any resolution the executive director put before it. This morning, the subcommittee will again be examining waste and mismanagement of public housing funds. Let me underscore that most of the 3,100 public housing authorities across this nation are doing a fine job under difficult circumstances in providing decent housing to low-income families. However, at many public housing authorities, there is serious mismanagement. There are abuses. There is waste that is costing taxpayers tens of millions of dollars. At today's hearing, we will be focusing on the operation of the public housing authorities in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Washington, D.C., both of which are on the HUD list of the 21 most troubled public housing authorities. Actually, troubled is not the adjective I would use to describe many of the public housing authorities on this list. It is much too mild a term to describe housing agencies where there are thousands of vacant units. At the same time, there are tens of thousands of people on endless waiting lists for public housing where it can take three to five years to get a vacant unit ready for a new tenant, where millions of dollars in federal funds are being misused and wasted every single year, where patronage controls hiring and contracts are based on favoritism and cronyism, not quality or price. All of these practices impact negatively on the tenants, the intended beneficiaries of these federal funds. 
It is the public housing residents and their families who continue to live in deplorable, unsafe and unsanitary dwellings. Tenants are living in apartments with broken windows, with holes in the ceiling, with leaking pipes without heat, with roaches, mice and rats. I hope that Vice President Quayle doesn't blame these conditions in public housing on the 1970s television, television situation comedy Good Times, which was set in a Chicago housing project. We will hear shocking testimony today from the HUD Inspector General. He will argue that since the 1970s, HUD has provided millions of dollars in operating subsidies to the Philadelphia Housing Authority for some 500 public housing units that no longer exist. Some of them were demolished decades ago. The HUD Inspector General will discuss the scathing report he issued this week on the Philadelphia Housing Authority. The HUD IG concluded that the Philadelphia Housing Authority, and I quote, is one of the worst situations of mismanagement ever reported by the Inspector General's office, end quote. That's quite a feat, considering the competition for that distinction. The IG found that 86 of the 87 units he inspected did not meet minimum housing standards. And several of the units were outright uninhabitable. This was not a surprise inspection. The Inspector General's office gave the Public Housing Authority of Philadelphia three weeks notice before they did the inspection. Maintenance work in places like Philadelphia is delayed interminably. For many of the 80,000 public housing tenants in Philadelphia, Elvis is seen more often than the maintenance staff. In Philadelphia, there are more than 4,500 vacant public housing units, about a 20% vacancy rate. At the same time, there are 15,000 people on the waiting list for public housing. It takes the Philadelphia Housing Authority on the average more than four years, more than four years, to fix up a unit for a new tenant. The HUD standard is 30 days. Vacant units do not provide housing for the homeless, for those living in emergency shelters, for those doubling or tripling up and living with others in unbelievably overcrowded conditions, or for others on the waiting list for public housing. Philadelphia Housing Authority loses over $300,000 every single month in rental income from these vacant units. In April of 1990, the Philadelphia Housing Authority entered into a short-term consulting contract with the housing agency's former executive director, who I might add did not do a very good job of running the agency, at a rate of just under $2,000 per hour, per hour. For that amount of money, they probably could have gotten a good plumber. A rate of $2,000 per hour is the equivalent of $4 million per year. That's a ludicrous salary to pay. Philadelphia has continuously been on HUD's list of the most troubled public housing authorities. Over the last decade, there have been more than 30 studies, audits, reports, task forces to review the studies, all detailing serious problems with the operation of uh, the Philadelphia Housing Authority and finding that public housing residents are not being provided decent housing.
but these practices haven't changed. In 1991, HUD gave the Philadelphia Housing Authority $84.5 million, its largest subsidy ever, far more than the Public Housing Authority asked for. Last week, acting on a request by the Philadelphia Housing Authority, HUD finally and mercifully took control of the agency. When HUD created a list in 1979 to identify the most troubled PHAs, public housing authorities, Washington, D.C. was a charter member of the list and has remained on it for 13 years and counting. The director of the D.C. Department of Public and Assistant, Assisted Housing, Ray Price, has said that over 50% of the housing units do not meet housing standards. In our nation's capital, there are currently 2,200 vacant units, a 19% vacancy rate, while there are 12,000 applicants on the waiting list for public housing. It costs the District of Columbia $3,000 a month to house a person in an emergency shelter, while there are 2,200 vacant public housing units. This is a disgrace. It takes Washington, D.C. on the average three years to fix up a public housing unit for a new tenant. That doesn't make any sense. In our nation's capital, it appears that $20,000 worth of supplies weekly are being stolen from D.C. public housing inventory, while the security staff watch broken television monitors, warehouse windows remain broken, supplies sitting in water corrode. Now, we are not talking about small items like nails and screws being taken, but we are talking about major items such as refrigerators and wood paneling disappearing from the warehouse. It also appears that the Washington, D.C. Housing Agency Procurement Office often pays for work that never gets done, is inadequate, unacceptable, and wasteful. In some cases, the Washington, D.C. Public Housing Agency is paying wages under contracts that are three times higher than the wage rate required under the Davis-Bacon Act. At many public housing agencies, the problems are getting worse, not better. Conditions are deteriorating. Vacancy rates are increasing. At today's hearing, we will be examining what steps HUD is taking to reduce mismanagement and waste in public housing authorities in Philadelphia, Washington, and elsewhere to improve living conditions for public housing tenants in these cities and elsewhere. And we would like to know when we can expect to see some changes and improvements. Finally, I want to mention that we requested Ray Price, the director of the D.C. Department of Public and Assistant Housing, to testify at today's hearing. He declined to appear today, citing a conflict with a previously scheduled two-day management retreat in Annapolis which I believe will begin at 2 o'clock. This doesn't send a positive message to D.C. public housing tenants. Perhaps district officials might consider having next year's retreat at a housing project in Washington, D.C. But we can be assured that Mr. Price will be testifying at our next public housing hearing and by subpoena if necessary. I'm pleased now to uh, turn the microphone over to my good friend and colleague, the ranking uh, minority member of the subcommittee. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I think everyone has been moved by listening to your opening statement. And if today we were to give an award for the, what is uh, referred to in the movie as the good, the bad, and the ugly, we've got the ugliest here today. 
And I don't say that uh, lightly. I have read some of the testimony. I have read some of the facts. And I think that what we're dealing with is an absolute disaster. When we have people sitting on the streets of our cities looking for housing, families who are looking for the bare essential room and board to take care of their needs, I think it's a absolute criminal activity with the total disregard for proper management that seems to be going on in at least two of our cities. Public housing in America has long been regarded as a serious problem. You don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to figure out that there are people walking the streets not because they want to, but because they have no choice. We have poured literally billions of dollars into public housing programs to try and meet the needs of those who cannot afford adequate housing. And yet we find that at least in two of our largest cities, I'm afraid the testimony is going to reflect what has been just a disaster in meeting the needs of the people in those situations. And we have heard stories that are frankly just unbelievable. No one in America, no one believes that you can lose $20,000 worth of stolen property a week, as is happening in D.C., without someone knowing what's going on and condoning this. I certainly don't believe it. And if anyone in this room who is about to testify believes that, I suggest that they ought to go back and rethink what life is all about. This is not a nickel and dime attrition. This is felony crime and it ought to be stopped. And it should have been stopped. How can we have two cities, one of which has been on the most troubled list for eight years and the other 13 years, and how can we then go to people in the streets and say we're doing our best? I find it absolutely unbelievable. When will we get these housing authorities to provide the necessary resources and quality management? The Malcolm Baldrige Award is given in this nation to manufacturing industries which understand the term quality. And if you don't know what quality is, you should read Philip Crosby's books or Deming's books. It's doing what the consumers need. It's not doing what you think is easy. It's not doing the, the thing that you think is best. It's doing what the consumers need. And in this case, the consumers are perhaps the most vulnerable. They are, it appears, the victims of the public housing authorities in D.C. and Philadelphia. They are not the beneficiaries. How can we have in D.C. 2,200 boarded up apartments and have the city paying $3,000 a month to take care of homeless people by putting them up in hotels and motels? I find that to be an incredible indictment of management practice. How can we have four years of time delay to fix up a unit. No one in America believes that it takes four years to rehabilitate a housing unit as it has been taking in Philadelphia. And why do these problems continue? I don't think there's a good answer. And I think today will be enlightening to find out at least what your attempts at justification are. Last week I think HUD acted responsibly in appointing a special administrator to assist the Philadelphia Housing Authority with their problems. Obviously, having been on the list for nine years in Philadelphia's case, 13 years in D.C.'s case, is I think an indictment of their management practices in and of itself. It is the job of the public housing authorities to manage the day-to-day -day operations of public housing facilities. We, the people on the streets who are looking for their assistance, look to them as leaders, not to the perpetrators of ineffective, inefficient, and what appears to be almost criminal activity. It is ultimately HUD's responsibility to oversee the Housing Authority. But I understand that this is a very difficult task in view of the fact that they have $2.5 billion in operating subsidies that the Housing Authorities will receive this year. But these are taxpayers' dollars. People are angry. When they hear these stories, they say, how can this happen? And we in Congress are trying to answer those questions, and today we hope we'll get some information to provide those answers. I'd like to take a moment, though, in this indictment process of at least these two public housing authorities, 
to commend Jack Kemp, who I think has done a remarkably good job in coming into the agency, trying to change what has been obviously poor management practices in the past, to put new emphasis on inner city development and particularly housing, to have innovative programs which will help low-income people to acquire ownership of their own homes. Who would want to buy a unit, though, in a building where at least half of the units are vacant, where windows are broken, electricity is not working, and where plumbers are scarcer than the dollars to pay the rent? I hope that today we can sort through these alleged issues and find out what's going on and that this will be the beginning of a miraculous turnabout in these public housing authorities. I, for one, am outraged at the facts which I have read, and I can't believe that anyone who listens to today's testimony, if the facts are as we have been uh, led to believe, would not also be outraged. I look forward to this testimony uh, with, frankly, indignation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Makeley. Uh, before we swear in the first panel, I want to express my appreciation to minority staff uh, in its, uh, for its help in preparing this hearing. But I particularly want to express my appreciation to Ms. Wendy Adler uh, and um, the Chief of Staff, uh, Ms. Stuart Weisberg, for their usual outstanding job in uh, preparing the hearing uh, uh, for this morning. Um, they represent uh, a little appreciated but indispensable component of the democratic process. They are the watchdogs of the public interest. Our uh, first panel um, represents uh, the leadership of the HUD Inspector General's Office. Uh, during the many years of our uh, HUD hearings, uh, uh, we have benefited enormously from their work, and I want to welcome them here. I'd like to swear you in, gentlemen, if you'll please stand. Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to offer is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Please be seated. Happy to welcome Mr. John Connors, Acting Inspector General of the Department of Housing and Urban uh, Department. If you'll kindly introduce your associates, uh, we'll place your entire record, uh, your entire statement in the record without objection, and you may proceed any way you choose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could you pull the mic close to you? Thank you. I am pleased to appear before you today to discuss HUD's public housing programs. Uh, with me today is Chris Greer on my left, who is the Assistant Inspector General for Audit. We are very pleased to have you, Mr. Greer. And Mr. Ed Mamarella, who is our Regional Inspector General for Audit in Philadelphia, is on my right. We are pleased to have you, sir. I have submitted the prepared testimony for the record and would like to make it part of the record. Without objection. As requested in your invitation, our testimony will cover three specific areas of concern. We will provide our historical perspective on the public housing programs and then discuss the results of our recent audit and investigative work highlighted by our May 26, 1992 audit report on the Philadelphia Housing Authority. Finally, we had some observations on HUD's ability to effectively monitor public housing programs. Mr. Chairman, there is a great deal of data available that clearly demonstrates that the vast majority of public housing agencies and their dedicated employees provide decent, safe, and sanitary housing to low-income families. We certainly do not want our comments to imply otherwise. There are, however, major problems in the manner in which many public housing agencies are managed. These are long-standing and pervasive problems. We believe the public housing programs to be one of HUD's most significant problem areas. The cost of operating the conventional public housing programs has, have escalated over the last 20 years. Federal operating subsidies total about $6.5 million in 1969, or $2.07 per unit per month. By 1990, operating subsidies had risen to $114 per unit per month, or $1.9 billion annually. 
Over the past decade, our audits have identified a pattern of serious operating management problems at some large public housing agencies. We have reported instances of inefficient and ineffective management, ineffective maintenance programs, weak tenant management practices, and inadequate co energy conservation measures. These practices are resulting in the loss or wasteful spending of millions of dollars annually. More importantly, many of these public housing agencies are not providing residents with decent housing. Our reports have often disclosed that living conditions are deteriorating, operating expenditures go unchecked, rents are not collected, and cash management and control practices are virtually non-existent. This is especially true for those located in large urban areas. Mr. Chairman, a clear example of this pattern of abuses is evident from our prior work on large troubled public housing agencies. Over the past 10 years, we have conducted numerous internal and project audits of public housing programs. Over the years, we have observed that conditions have generally worsened. As a result of these reports, the Office of Management and Budget requested that we focus resources on auditing troubled public housing agencies this year. Assistant Secretary Schiff echoed this request. Currently, we are auditing, uh, auditing 11 large agencies, and the situation in many respects is much worse than it was in 1984 and 1987 when we completed our last major reviews of public housing programs. It should be further noted that investigations of fraud in these programs during fiscal years 1989 through 1991 resulted in 112 indictments and 84 convictions of persons or firms for misusing public housing funds. Court-ordered restitutions or fines amounted to $1.9 million. Currently, we have 123 pending investigations. In summary, Mr. Chairman, there are significant problems with the management practices at many public housing agencies. Concerted efforts are needed at the federal, state, and local levels to overcome these problems in order to better serve the resident populations that these programs were designed to benefit. I would now like to take a few minutes to describe our May 26, 1992 audit report of the Philadelphia Housing Authority. We are providing a copy of the report should you wish to enter it into the record. Without objection, it will be entered in the record in its entirety. The report discusses many areas of waste and abuse and is the latest in a litany of negative reports on the Philadelphia Housing Authority. As you know, on May 20th, 1992, six days before we issued our final report, the Housing Authority signed an agreement with HUD, thereby relinquishing to HUD all power and authority to act as and for the Housing Authority pursuant to the annual contributions contract. It is important to note that this agency... Could I just stop you there for a minute? Is this really a sort of a last resort action? I mean, when nothing works year after year after year, uh, in final desperation, HUD takes over? Yes, it's a drastic action, and um, it, it has only happened, I believe, four or five times uh, by the department. Do you recall where those other takeovers... Passaic, I believe, was one. Passaic was one. Uh, I believe Chester, uh, Chester, East Saint, Pennsylvania. Chester, Pennsylvania, East St. Louis, um, and there's currently, I believe, a workout agreement in Kansas City where we're working with the Kansas City Housing Authority. Please go ahead. It is important to note that this agency, the Philadelphia Housing Authority, is a major corporation and is responsible for an annual budget exceeding well over $150 million in federal funding. These funds include operating subsidies, Section 8 program funds, comprehensive improvement assistance program funds, and community development block grant funds. Our report contains nine specific findings. Briefly, we found that, one, the agency failed to provide decent, safe, and sanitary housing to tenants in 86 of 87 housing units that we inspected. The agency has over 4,500 vacant units that are not being repaired and occupied according to HUD standards. Agency maintenance repairs are not timely, resulting in dissatisfied tenants who are not getting decent housing and are not paying their rents. Four, tenants owe the agency over $6.5 million for rent resulting in uncollectible accounts rising from $4.5 million in 1988 to $6.3 million in 1991. Five, the agent's, 
agency's financial condition is steadily deteriorating and operating reserves have declined by 41 percent over the last five fiscal years. Six, the agency received $1 million in ineligible operating subsidy for housing that had been demolished. The last three findings involve needed reforms to general administration, personnel practices, and audit follow-up and deficiency correction. Mr. Chairman, collectively these findings represent one of the worst situations of mismanagement ever reported by our office. In addition to those matters just discussed, our report points out nine other areas needing further study. We did not fully examine these areas because of time and resource constraints. For example, we noted questionable questionable expenditures of petty cash and travel funds used to pay parking tickets, lunches, and dinners. In addition, over 1,200 tenants did not have their income re-examined to determine if they were paying the proper rental rates. Various activities at the Philadelphia Housing Authority have been the subject of both civil and criminal investigations. For example, contracting activities are the focus of ongoing joint investigative work with several federal agencies. In 1988, the owner and two employees of an elevator repair firm pled guilty to overbilling the Housing Authority. They were sentenced to various jail terms, required to repay $210,000 on criminal charges, and subsequently paid another $110,000 based on a civil fraud suit by the United States Attorney. We believe the ineffective management practices and poor internal control structure at the Philadelphia Housing Authority set the stage for fraud and abuse. Regarding HUD monitoring, our office has issued numerous internal audit reports over the years criticizing its timeliness and effectiveness. Again, we would like to preface our remarks with the statement that most HUD employees are diligent in carrying out their assigned duties. Very seldom do we encounter situations where HUD employees simply ignore their jobs. Nevertheless, problems in monitoring are well documented in past audit reports. There is little argument between current HUD management and our office about the existence of significant monitoring weaknesses. Monitoring, whether on-site or remote, is staff-intensive and information-driven. Assistant Secretary Schiff and his staff have made concerted efforts to significantly increase the potential for effective and comprehensive monitoring, despite shortfalls in both staff and data systems. At this point, however, we question whether the improved processes can be implemented efficiently. Funding for the public housing programs under Assistant Secretary Schiff has grown significantly over the past few years. In addition, increased responsibilities in the form of new programs have received high priority, often at the expense of the conventional housing programs. However, the size of the Office of Public and Indian Housing staff has remained about the same for several years. Thus, it is not realistic to presume that effective monitoring can prevail. One potential way to overcome staff shortages is to, is to design a monitoring strategy that targets available resources at high-risk participants. At Secretary Kemp's direction, HUD is currently implementing such a strategy for all programs. Again, Assistant Secretary Schiff and his deputy, Mike Janis, should be commended for the aggressive way they have gone about designing future monitoring strategies. However, given the current level of staff resources and the state of HUD's financial information systems, we believe that monitoring efforts will continue to suffer. Mr. Chairman, our office has appeared before this subcommittee quite often over the past few years concerning several different programmatic matters. As with many of our recent statements, we are convinced that top management of the public and Indian housing programs have identified the problems and have established a framework for addressing those problems. However, the most difficult part remains to be accomplished, that is implementing the, the changes effectively and making the new tools and techniques a permanent part of HUD operations. Thank you for your attention. That concludes my statement. Thank you very much, Ms. Connors. Uh, before I begin the questioning, may I ask my colleague from California, would you like to make an opening statement? No, Chairman, I'm more in no Mr. Chairman, I'm more interested in listening to the witnesses. Very good. We are most happy to have you. Um, Ms. Connors, uh, this is a shocking list of particulars. One of the most shocking findings uh, that you report is that the Philadelphia Housing Agency has been receiving federal subsidies for public housing units that had been demolished some decades ago. 
I really have two questions. I'd like to ask you to give us an estimate of the amount of uh, public housing subsidies that Philadelphia has been getting for housing units that don't exist. They're fictional. And secondly, explain to me how such a thing technically could occur. I mean, you start out, I take it, with Philadelphia claiming that they have a thousand units. And you allocate the subsidy figure based on that figure. Then over a period of time, say a hundred of those units is demolished. Whose responsibility is it to report that Philadelphia no longer has a thousand units, but only 900 units? Is it their responsibility to report it to you? Is it HUD's responsibility to periodically verify that the number of units for which HUD is providing subsidies do in fact exist? As I stated in my testimony, uh, there were approximately 500 units that had been demolished. And over the past, uh, I believe, two years, that resulted in excess of $1 million in ineligible subsidy. Uh, I'd like Mr. Marmorello to elaborate on the question since he is uh, the signer of the Philadelphia report and is intimate with all the details. Mr. Marmorello, we'll be glad to hear from you. Pull the mic close to you, please. Mr. Chairman, as of this date, we still do not have an accurate and verified count as to how many units have been demolished. The Philadelphia Housing Authority has one of the largest scattered site programs in the country with 7,402 units approved. Most of these are single-family row houses scattered geographically throughout the city neighborhoods. In 1990, HUD allocated funding of about approximately $350,000 for the Philadelphia Housing Authority to award a special contract to identify the exact number and status of the 7,400 units that were approved. To date, the contract, to the best of our knowledge, has still not been awarded. In 1991, the Philadelphia Housing Authority advised HUD that at least 495 demolished units were known at that time. We computed the subsidy that HUD had paid PHA for these units to be at least $1,046,000. But that's only for the last uh, couple of years, isn't it? That's correct. That well, how about, I mean, your testimony indicates that for decades some of these units did not exist. For a number of those 495 units, we have not been able to determine the exact demolition date. And as I indicated, we still are Do not... Do you need a permit in Philadelphia to demolish a house? Yes, you do. Well, why is it then so difficult to determine when a house was demolished? That most of these properties were torn down by the city's Department of License and Inspections as imminent dangers to the neighboring properties. Well, does the Department of License and Inspections maintain records as to what they do? Yes, and they also notify the owners of the properties of the um, demolition. In this case, that would be the Philadelphia Housing Authority. Mr. Chairman, it's my understanding that the purpose of the contract that is to be let by the Philadelphia Housing Authority is to determine the amount of actual scattered site units and to co come up with a reconciliation of what has been demolished. That will be accomplished by um, contacting the licensing bureau in Philadelphia. That's the only way it can be accomplished from what I understand. Uh, this item first came to light during our audit of the Community Development uh, Block Grant Program and we pursued it further in this audit of Philadelphia Housing Authority. Well, I understand that you gentlemen are trying to clean up a mess and, and we, we are with you, but I still want to understand the process. At one point, it is your sworn testimony, 7,402 units were claimed to exist in the city of Philadelphia, which were entitled to subsidies. Is that correct? Yes. That is correct. Okay. Now, who submitted that figure? 
the Philadelphia Housing Authority. The Philadelphia, so presumably at some point they counted the number of units. That is and they correct. said we have 7,402 units. Yes, sir. Now whose responsibility is it to advise HUD that 500 of those units no longer exist? It would be the Philadelphia Housing Authorities in their next budget submission. So it is their responsibility to report demolished units? Yes, sir. And over the course of all of these years, they have not done so? To the best of my knowledge, no. I'll be happy to yield to my friend. I think the chairman earlier was trying to, deter to find out why it's so difficult to determine uh, how many units and when they were demolished. Uh, unless Philadelphia is different, almost every city, when they demolish because of, them, uh, because of uh, danger, public danger, they go through an eminent uh, domain procedure that, that gives them the authority to do that. Uh, and that's got to be a matter of public record, and they have to hold that in, in the city records. Isn't it a simple matter of requesting uh, the City Hall of Philadelphia to provide you with the records of when these were demolished, and they should be able to do it uh, fairly easy through the Public Works Department there. I think what you described is, is accurate as far as uh, the city maintaining the records, etc. I'm not sure if all these houses were demolished as a result of eminent domain. Um, it's my understanding that the, and, and Mr. Marmorello will have to elaborate on this, but that the records at the licensing department um, were not all available. Is that? Yes, that's correct because some of these records go back 20 some years and they have uh, eliminated a lot of the supporting documentation. And uh, the license and inspection department does not have to go through the lengthy eminent domain process, I understand it, but has the authority in an imminent danger situation. And there have been several of these in Philadelphia where children have been killed because properties collapsed, etc., to go in and to demolish it for the safety of the neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Pomerella, you live in Philadelphia? No, sir, I live in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Suburbs. How long have you lived in the Philadelphia area? All my life. All your life. How long have you been working for the IG? Uh, since 1966, 26 years. There are no term limits on, on your job, I think. <laughs> since 1966, all right? Uh, during all these years, have you been aware of the fact that there have been demolitions of public housing units that were continuing to receive subsidies? Did this, did this revelation come as a shock to you, as a surprise to you? Or did you have a sneaking suspicion that there might be housing units which exist only like Brigadoon in, in, in people's minds, but not in reality? We first became aware of this problem and the significance of it approximately 1988, when we had completed a community development pull, and block pull the grant. Mic, please. When we had completed a community development and block grant audit in the city of Philadelphia, and we had then found out that Department of License and Inspections was demolishing units that were owned by the Philadelphia Housing Authority. And then we then started to do a cursory review to determine if this reduction of units had been reported to HUD in Philadelphia, and they had not. Does the head of the Housing Authority need to certify the number of units that he claims to have under his jurisdiction? I'm not sure in that exact term. They do have to sign the budget submissions that are submitted to the department, which contains the total number of units. Well, in every remotely comparable activity, for instance, in a school district, somebody is responsible for signing and verifying the number of school children who are in school every day because the school district gets its funding on the base of the number of children it educates. It would be reasonable to assume that a housing authority must have some responsible individual certifying that the number of units they claim to be having and getting subsidies on does in fact exist. Isn't that true? Yes. Does this exist? The, the, they have to sign the budget to certify that what they're submitting is accurate. I, I'm not just sure if the exact language, quote, certification, unquote, is contained on the but document. There is a report, Mr. Chairman, uh, that
that they do submit to HUD their budget request, um, attesting that there are so many uh, units available. Um, those, those estimates have not been accurate. Uh, and part of what we bring out in the audit report is that they have very poor controls at the Housing Authority, um, that there has been a turnover of people, that they have lousy systems. They do not know today how many scattered site units have been demolished. Well, do you have to be a rocket scientist to walk the streets and find how many of the 7,402 units still exist? I mean, I a, a, a small group of high school students would take a few couple of weekends to walk through the streets. There are addresses for these units, uh, aren't there? Yes. I would assume. I'm yes. sorry, I yes. can't hear yes, you. Yes, there are. There are addresses. Yes. So you walk down the street and... Uh, There are eight houses and then there is, a, there is an empty lot which is getting subsidy. Why is that so difficult to ascertain, Mr. Mamarella? I have no idea. It doesn't seem that it should be that difficult. Well, but you're telling me you first became aware of this in 1988, which is four years ago. What happened in the four-year period? How diligently <laughs> did you and your staff pursue the problem? We brought it to the attention of the HUD management in Philadelphia, which at that time brought it to the attention of a newly appointed executive director. When was he newly appointed? I believe in 1990, May of 1990. And? And th at that point in time, HUD determined that they didn't have the resources to go out and count the units. I believe that because of all the systems... Well, what enormous resources are required to walk down the street and count the number of units that no longer exist? How much, how much is HUD giving Philadelphia for public housing every year? About? About $100 million dollars in subsidy. And what would you estimate is the cost of ascertaining whether 7,402 units do in fact exist? I mean, if you were to go into the private sector tomorrow morning and I give you a contract to count 7,402 units, what would be a reasonable contract price, including profit? I have no idea, but the HUD management staff has allocated $350,000 for that task. Now, last year, HUD gave Philadelphia 500 $500,000 to count these units. Is that correct? I believe the initial estimate was $350,000, uh, but then that contract has not been awarded yet, and I'm not sure They, why. Where does one apply for that contract? <laughs> It sounds like a marvelous, uh, marvelous opportunity. <coughs> Hopefully it will be advertised. The, okay. the Philadelphia Housing Authority, I believe, is delayed in letting that contract. HUD allocated a minimum of $350,000 for that contract to inspect those units um, to determine the number of units in the inventory. I'm sure that we'll see quicker action now that HUD uh, has much more active interest in this authority. I'd still like to get a figure out of you gentlemen, all of you, as to your ballpark figure of the amount of taxpayer money that went to Philadelphia to subsidize units over the decades that some of these units did not exist. If I could uh, interject Please. here, I, I think it'd be safe to say it'd be somewhere between five to seven million dollars. Five to seven million dollars. You don't Conser conservative estimate. Conser what would be a, a, a realistic estimate, not a conservative estimate? Probably on the high range of that, seven, eight, nine million. Seven, eight, nine. Ten, if I push you. <laughs> <laughs> This is not an auction, is it? <laughs> well, we are already bidding on the contract to count the houses that have been demolished, so we might as well go on. So you 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 figure that. Uh, 
upwards of seven, eight, nine million dollars was given to Philadelphia to subsidize housing units that existed only in the minds of the beholder. That's correct. That's correct. Well, let me ask another question, if I may. And I realize that these are ballpark estimates. What would be your judgment, uh, any of you gentlemen, of the amount of taxpayer dollars lost annually because of mismanagement and waste in Philadelphia, in the Public Housing Authority? As we stated in our prepared statement, uh, many, many housing authorities manage their programs efficiently and effectively. Based on, and it's, this is a very difficult I know. Uh, figure to guesstimate at best, um, but it would, be, it would be our estimate that it would be most likely in the tens of millions of dollars uh, that wa due to waste and mismanagement, dollars are misspent and lost. Are you finding comparable problems here in Washington, D.C.? We've initiated survey work in Washington, D.C. Uh, and the purpose of our survey is to develop areas uh, which we will subsequently perform detailed audit testing and which will result in an audit report similar to Philadelphia where we would have an issued report. Uh, again, Mr. Mamarello's staff is responsible for conducting this work, and he could highlight for you a couple of areas that have come out of the survey. Please go ahead. Our survey had indicated that there are significant problems, many similar to those found in Philadelphia, existing in the Department of Public and Assisted Housing in the district. Our present audit is focusing on areas such as ho housing quality standards where we find again many units deficient, maintenance deficiencies, procurement deficiencies, warehouse and security inventory. What do you mean in English when you say procurement deficiencies? Okay. Specifically contract work items which were awarded which were never performed and poor quality workmanship. Well if if contracts are awarded, and I take it subsequently payment is made for work not performed, are criminal investigations underway? Yes, Mr. Chairman. We currently are coordinating our efforts, both our audit and investigative staffs, uh, with the U.S. Attorney's Office here in the district. And it's an, on it's an ongoing matter, and we shouldn't discuss it any further. Well, let me ask you a question or two. What is your present estimate, gentlemen, of the number of years, for instance, contracts have been awarded by the Washington, D.C. Public Housing Authority for work which subsequently was not performed but payments were made? How long a period are you looking at? Uh, our review presently will go back a period of uh, three years. And it is your present judgment that such outrages occurred during that three-year period? Yes, we have indications that that's true. Is there any reason why we don't go back four years? We've done previous work in the Washington, D.C. area. In addition, HUD has uh, I believe they last monitored uh, the D.C. area in 1988, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct, Ed? 89. 89. Uh, so going back three years, we're picking up from where they, they left off, and that's a comfortable audit period given the resources that we have, and it should give us um, a good look at, at the Washington Housing Authority. Go ahead, Mr. Mamarello. <clears throat> We've also found significant inventory problems, indicators of significant in inventory problems. Uh, 
As you have indicated, there have been verified thefts of major equipment items from the warehouse, excessive inventory items such as 12,000 kitchen light fixtures on hand when the authority only has approximately 9,000 occupied units. And uh, so Could you repeat that? Uh, excessive inventory items. For example, they have over 12,000 kitchen light fixtures on hand, although they only have about 9,000 occupied units. So that would be an excessive number of one particular item, and this is just an example of an item. We have items we found that... Now, is it reasonable to assume that uh, this excessive inventory is the result of uh, stupidity? Or is it the result of uh, trying to get a big contract for a friend and maybe getting a kickback? Hopefully our audit will determine what the cause of that was. Sir. Uh, my friend, uh, colleague, uh, has to go over to Armed Services but would like to ask a couple of questions at this point, so I'm yielding the microphone to Congressman Makley. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you yielding. And I have to slip out for a few minutes, but I'll try and get back. Um, I note in your report that there are approximately uh, uh, 12 to 1,400 employees in the, public, in the Philadelphia Housing uh, Association. Is that correct? I believe it's closer to 1,700, sir, with all the programs. 1,700? Yes, sir. Uh, and I also note that uh, you talk about consultant contracts, which were in some case duplicative of these employees. For instance, in uh, May of uh, May 2nd, 1990, the former executive director resigned. Uh, he was then paid to work one hour a week. He was paid $40,000 or $1,951 an hour for consulting services over a five-month period, which ended September 27th, 1990. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. Then I note that uh, you list in your report uh, some 257,000 consultant contracts, uh, which include, uh, and this one I'm sure was, uh, would be interesting to look at, a public information, public relations contract for $25,000, uh, including a design and construction contract for $10,000 and $9,000. One which uh, is peculiar is a contract 207, uh, which was for $9,999.99, which might just happen to be coincidentally one cent below the $10,000 limit before they had to go to some sort of public briefing. Did you in your investigation as an IG look knowing of the uh, number of employees, 1,700, knowing of the types of past practices, were you able to conclude anything about whether these contracts were either excessive or criminal and have you done anything about it? Well, as we mentioned in our report, sir, uh, the reason we raised this issue as questionable cost is because it did appear to us that the Housing Authority had personnel on staff who seemingly could accomplish the same type of function. And in our opinion, it wasn't justified that they needed to go out and hire a consultant to do that. And we did find uh, several instances, many instances of $9,999.99 and there is an ongoing criminal investigation. On these consulting contracts? On work at the Philadelphia Housing Authority. Now, I have one other quick question. You have pictures in your report of some of the houses, uh, this being one of the pictures, which is very, I think, graphic. Uh, this showing uh, the ceiling being completely uh, rotted out and in, in fact, on this page, you s this is on the West Jefferson Street property, you say an entire household of five sleeps in one bedroom because two bedrooms are uninhabited, uninhabitable. Uh, you state that 99% of all units have serious, I'll use your term here, uh, were not decent, safe, or sanitary, 99%. 
we inspected uh, 86 units, 87 units, 86 of those units uh, did not meet HUD standards. And in fact, each unit had an average of 11 violations uh, per unit of what we inspected. And I believe that's where the 99% comes from, is just based on our inspections of those units. What are the maintenance people doing if 99% of the units are not just uh, apparently uh, having some deficiencies, but not safe for inhabitants? Are they? In fact, uh, just sitting around not doing their work, is anyone checking them? Did you find evidence of a fraud on the part of maintenance people not actually doing work? There, there's also a finding in our report that does address the uh, lack of productivity by the maintenance staff. We found them to be very unproductive and just unable to really accumulate a number of uh, units and get them online within a reasonable period of time. Part of it is due to the way they're organized. Disorganized would be probably a better term of trying to provide the maintenance service. They're basically work order driven rather than performance driven and, or paper driven rather than actually going out and performing the work. Well, if, if you had uh, some large number of units that they couldn't uh, account for, uh, did you look to see whether these were no-shows and whether people are actually uh, appearing at the jobs and doing what they're supposed to do? There was a, um, uh, uh, we of course interviewed over a hundred employees at the Housing Authority and spoke to many maintenance men. Uh, th there was a problem that the uh, work crews often, because of the way they were divided and they supplied with the equipment and trucks, weren't very productive during the day. So if out of an eight hour day, uh, for example, painters may be only painting, let's say, four hours. Also, they had a policy where the uh, maintenance workers would call off on sick leave after lunch. They wouldn't be charged for sick leave for the day. That was a pretty unique policy. Is that yes, we consistent with other public housing authorities? That's the first time we've ever seen that. Uh, I'll have to yield back. Very good. You were listing deficiencies in D.C. when we yielded to my colleague. Would you please continue, Ms. Mamaro? I believe we were discussing the excessive inventory items. Yes. Uh, contracting. S significant indicators of, st of problems in contracting. They still do not have written contracting procedures. We are still unable to obtain a list from anyone of all the contracts that are, were executed. And well, don't you have the authority to obtain those? Yes, we've asked for it, but they can't provide it. We're trying to get that. We have the authority. We've asked. Um, we have subpoena authority for documents, if, if need be. Um, that's, that's a pretty drastic step to take. Right now, the audit is still in its initial stages after the survey. If the records cannot be for furnished, we, we can go to the subpoena route. Does HUD require written procedures for contracting? Yes. HUD requires them, and good business would require them. Now, how, now but, but the testimony is DC doesn't have it. That's correct. That's an initial condition that we've come up with our survey and I think what Mr. Mamarello is elaborating on are those areas that we're going to focus on further in our detailed audit work and then we will be able to determine the causes for not having those and the potential effect. Um, in other words, is contracting proper uh, at the DC Housing Authority? Well, what, what, what would you think is the likely answer? Well, our, based on our initial survey, um, I'm not sure the results are going to be very good. Uh, I think we will find problems. That's the safest statement of the morning. <laughs> Go ahead, Ms. Mamarella. Um, in, uh, again, I think you addressed the issue about the warehouse security. It's basically a two-story block-wide structure that's wide open, many unsecured uh, access points. Uh, security guards who basically sit in front of blank monitors. Um, uh, 
water leakage, uh, the authority, the um, district department of You mean security guards sit in front of monitors that do not work? That's correct. Well, that's a picture of an insane asylum, isn't it? I mean, it's not a, not a guarded warehouse. Now, what do the people in charge tell you when you point this out to them? Well, I believe uh, Mr. Price has provided some kind of testimony and is aware of that. Uh, we haven't, uh, the only thing we have been able to determine so far on that is that they aren't hooked up is because someone stole the cameras that would uh, take the pictures to view on the, on the monitors. It was a judicious move given the, the circumstances, I would say. Um, what is the estimate of $20,000 a week being stolen based on, may I ask? That's based on information provided by the inventory chief of the Department of Public and Assisted Housing. And what does the inventory chief say when he says $20,000 of the inventory I'm responsible for is being stolen every week? That's, that's his estimate. Uh, he has not gone into greater detail. We will be pursuing this with him. It's possible that he is underestimating what's being stolen every week? It's possible. Could it be 30000 a week? Yes. We have no way of determining that at this point. We will be looking into this during our review. Go ahead. Uh, we've also determined that the uh, district has paid approximately $110,000 a year to heat this warehouse, although there's, it's hard to find one window intact in the entire building. That's, the, that's, right. that's basically the area, sir. Right. I'll have to ask you to suspend for a moment because we have a vote uh, and we'll resume in about five minutes. In the absence of the chairman, he's given me authority to start the hearing again. And uh, uh, I'm not sure that he was finished with his question. Uh, my question might run into the period of time that he comes back, and if he hasn't finished, he can continue with his question. Uh, I just am surprised by this whole thing and the lack of adequate management, both from HUD's perspective and the Housing Authority's perspective over there. But you understand, in my mind, we're the ones that are paying the money. It's the ultimate responsibility of making sure that we're getting uh, true value for the dollar being spent uh, lies with with the federal government and with, in this case, the HUD agency in requiring that the uh, housing authority to keep accurate records and provide accurate rep records. And since I'm somewhat familiar with uh, property management, I can tell you this, that it's very easy to determine whether or not a unit is there or not simply by the fact that if it's vacant for a period of time, there's got to be a reason that it's vacant for a period of time. And if I keep getting a uh, certification uh, for payment that includes a 4,500 vacant public units and those units have been vacant for a long time, I'm going to ask the question, oh, what's, what is the problem here? Why haven't we rented these vacant? The other responsibility lie with the housing authority itself and the commissioners that uh, have that responsibility there on a local level. Why didn't they? It's a very simple f fact is that if you've got a certain number of units, let's say in this case 20,000 units, 22,500 units, and you're collecting rents from some and not from others, that intake has got to tell you there's something wrong. If I'm running this thing as a business, like most private management has done for, uh, for, for private-held uh, units, uh, they're going to want to know why a unit's not rented. They want to rent every unit because they make a profit from every unit being rented. If they have a vacancy factor that exceeds a certain percentage, they're not making any money. And the only thing they're able to care is the depreciation on it and the uh, uh, maintenance and upkeep that they can declare on their, uh, on their annual income tax report, but they need, need to keep those units filled. And it seems to me that 
and it's not that difficult. We've, we've heard, we we're into the age of computers. The housing authority, the city, all of these people have you know, computer units available to them that they have a tr record of location, address and location of each of those units. And if something is wrong over a period of time, and now let me ask the question, uh, we are, have been able to determine that in the case of some of these units that have been torn down, they've been torn down for s several years, isn't that right? Yes, that's correct. So that means that for several years there has been in the certification a unit, and it has to be designated, a unit that has been vacant for several years. Why didn't somebody somewhere on the long, along the line, either there in Philadelphia or at HUD, ask why is that unit vacant and why are we paying for a vacant unit for that length of time? The, the Housing Authority is responsible to know their stock, maintain their stock, and keep adequate information. They do not have a comprehensive management information system. It's just non-existent at the Housing Authority. Well, we know that. We understand that. But what I'm saying here is it's an easy thing to say, well, they had the responsibility. Hey, listen, if I'm paying money out and I'm in charge and responsible for that money, I have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to know that I'm getting true value for my dollar. In this particular case, they weren't. And I would have asked that question. Why are we paying for several years, four or five years, for a vacant unit? Mr. Martinez, our, our office has gone on record uh, saying that we do not believe the department has sufficient resources to carry out all of its functions effectively. Um, as I said in my statement, uh, monitoring by the department has been deficient uh, over the past few years. Um, they've re monitoring staff in the field have gotten additional responsibilities with new programs. Uh, and. Do, they just do not have the resources to get out there as they have. This is why risk-based monitoring is needed. If I recall correctly, the Philadelphia Housing Authority had not been monitored by HUD since 1987. In 1990, there was a uh, uh, contract let to have a private firm go in and do an assessment. Um, monitoring has to be more often in order for it to be effective, and, and that is part of the problem. You know the quickest way to stop a speeder, speeder on the highway? Put a policeman in plain sight. That's monitoring. You know, if these people don't real, uh, realize, or if these people realize that they're not going to be audited in that length of time, and there seems to be in one of these reports I read that there was audits and the audits were questionable. But if they're not being watched, they're going to get away with all kinds of things, that's for sure. If they don't feel that they need to make accurate reports and reporting their housing stock, they're not going to do it. But that doesn't uh, uh, allow HUD or anybody else to get away from their responsibility. They have the primary responsibility. I don't care what anybody says. They had the primary responsibility to make sure that the dollars they were paying out were going for good value, and they didn't. The problem here is, is that it's not that difficult. You're talking about uh, anywhere from 350000 to $500,000 uh, to find out how many of these, vacants have been, uh, these vacant units reported have been demolished. It's a very simple thing. They have the addresses and locations of the units that they're claiming on that certification, 4,500 vacant. All they need to do is get the address and location of those and track those down, and it's not going to take $300,000 to do it, even if you don't get public records to, do, to show you which have been demolished. It's a sham to spend another $350,000 to determine that 4,500 4, units don't exist, because maybe all of them do exist. But it's up to the HUD to tell them, since they've been certifying these things, for them to prove it. Why should the federal government pay $350,000 to determine something that that housing authority has primarily responsibility of determining that they are there or not there, since they're the ones that claim payment on them? Can you answer me that? I think the answer is that now that HUD has taken over the agency, as Mr. Connor said earlier, that is going to happen now. Well, I hope so. But I don't think it's going to cost $350,000 to determine 4,500 units what happened to them. We hope Because you not. have the address and location of those units. They have to have them to certify them. They have to have them in their inventory. Somewhere they have, the Housing Authority has a list. And all they have to do is, and on that list is identified, if they did any kind of bookkeeping at all, those units and where they are. 
We agree simple. with you. We, we're not endorsing the $350,000 contract. No. Well, it, it seems to me that, uh, you know, that, it, that we get hung up on uh, spending more money and more money after bad. Uh, the manage the, there's two problems here. One is the management and the other is the record keeping. Uh, and the management, uh, how do, the housing authority there, how do they give out these contracts to who to manage these things? How do they, isn't there any qualification of a, of a company that is reputable, that's been in business? There are, there are people who do property management that are very reputable and they do it because they, they make a profit from it. And if the, if the management is given over to somebody that is responsible to make a profit for it, his salary is based on the profit he makes rather than, hey, you get in trouble, we'll give you another $500,000. That's not the way to do that. We agree. And so I think that the management is one problem and, and HUD taking over I don't think is the final answer. I think HUD has to find somebody reliable, somebody that knows property management, somebody that's done it uh, for a reasonable amount of time, not somebody that's going to hire their cousins and brothers. Because I'll tell you, in a company that's profit oriented, they're not going to hire their cousins who's going to take off half a day because uh, after lunch he gets uh, too bloated to work. I mean, that's simply not going to happen. Right. And so I think they have to look at the management. They also have to look at their own record keeping as far as just a certification from someone isn't sufficient. At least not until that person has proven themselves trustworthy of, of accurate certified records. Uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Congressman Shays. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Um, are local housing authorities bound by federal ethics uh, statutes? There's certain provisions in uh, their contracts, annual contributions contracts. They have conflict of interest uh, provisions and things like that. But I, I don't, I don't think they are uh, bound uh, strictly by the federal ethics laws. Do you think they're they private corporations uh, incorporated within the various states? Do you think they should be? I think the provisions in the annual contributions contract probably are are sufficient at this point in time. Okay. Um, another question I want to ask, we're, we're looking at uh, Philadelphia and Washington, D.C., um, and recognize there are problems there, but just as when we were doing the HUD investigation of a few years ago, and someone would ask, um, is there a problem in this division, the answer was almost an emphatic yes without even knowing because there was a problem everywhere. And I guess the question I want to ask you is, uh, do you think that, that uh, what we're seeing in these two housing authorities is unique or an indication that we have problems in other housing authorities around the country? In my, in my opening statement, I um, had said that a number of large public housing authorities, primarily in the larger urban cities who have, which have been on the troubled list for years, I believe are experiencing similar problems um, as to what we're finding in Philadelphia and Washington. Uh, we currently have audit work ongoing in 11 cities and we anticipate having those audit reports uh, finalized and issued by the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What are those 11 cities, Mr. Connors? Uh, Mr. Greer has a listing Please. here. We're currently doing audits in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, Newark, New Jersey. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, the agency here in this district, Toledo, Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio, which is the Cuyahoga Metropolitan Housing Authority, Jacksonville, Florida, Houston, Texas, Kansas City, Missouri, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. And we're started working in the Puerto Rican Housing Authority, but there's some move afoot to privatize that, so we're not sure if we're going to continue past the survey stage in that audit. Approximately when will these audits be completed? Um, we'll probably have about two a month for the next three or four months through the end of uh, the fiscal year. Now my understanding, gentlemen, is that HUD must do an annual management review of uh, public housing agencies that are on the troubled list. Is that correct? Yes. Is HUD current with these reviews in Philadelphia and in Washington, D.C.? No, they're not. Um, I think the last review in Philadelphia was in 
uh, the summer, maybe the fall of 1987. Uh, but as John just said, they, they did contract and have a private contractor review Philadelphia in 1990. Uh, in the district, I believe, 1989, mid-89 was the last uh, management review. Well, can you expand on that a little bit uh, for me? If you have a mandate to have an annual management review and you are not doing that, I take it you are not doing it because you don't have adequate staff. Is that the reason? I, yes, that's what, that's what our office has said before. We do not believe the department, with its current information systems, which are pretty lousy, have adequate staff to conduct annual monitoring reviews of every public housing agency. One of the things that we've worked with the department on and which Secretary Kemp has endorsed uh, and wrote a letter, I believe it was last January, was to develop what is called an, accounting, uh, an accountability monitoring strategy where you would focus resources, this would be program resources, on those high risk areas uh, based on um, certain indicators and this would be program resources on those high risk areas uh, based on um, certain indicators and that those would be the cities, the grantees, the participants where you would monitor uh, routinely, annually. Those housing authorities which the department knows based on criteria which are well managed, well run, uh, have um, very few vacancies where units are repaired and occupied within 30 days would not be looked at. Okay, um, There has to be a risk-based system to maximize HUD's use of its resources. Mr. Chairman, we don't want to leave the impression that HUD hasn't looked at either one of those agencies at all over those periods of years because I think you understand that when a PHA is troubled that has a uh, memorandum of agreement with the agency and submit quarterly reports. What we're talking about is going on site and doing an in-depth monitoring review. Those are the things that haven't been done and need to be done. Taking large agencies, which would be the two or three which in your judgment are the best in terms of their operations? That's real difficult for us to say as we've told you several times before. We almost always go where we think there are problems. That's where we spend our resources. But there are some large PHAs that, that uh, have done uh, reasonably good jobs. Well, we uh, would like at least an indication from you as to which, which of those agencies might be used as models. I, I, I think uh, I understand your reluctance, but nevertheless, I will need to press you a bit. I mean, there have to be some large public housing agencies which do a reasonably good job. I guess what we're saying is we haven't looked to see which ones are good. We, we look and see which ones are bad. I Perhaps understand, you but you must make some judgment on the basis of some indication as to which ones are bad, and by definition, the ones you are not looking at are likely to be better. Are there any of those that you would be prepared to name? I can't. Not, not at this point. Uh, what I'd like to have an opportunity to do is, is meet with staff and submit something for the record to you. That would be very helpful because we would like to uh, publicize uh, those agencies that do a fine job under difficult circumstances. It's, uh, it's very important for us to highlight the problems, but I think it's equally our responsibility to, to highlight the achievements, and we need your help in that. Is there anything further any of you gentlemen would like to say? No, sir. Yes, sir. Congressman Chase has another question. The chairman uh, asked you a question, and, and the response, I guess, Mr. Greer, was that um, uh, the current information systems are lousy. And um, lousy is uh, worse than bad, <laughs> in my judgment. Um, and I guess I, I would like you to just expand as to what you mean by that. I think that was my statement. I'm sorry. Um, that's OK. Uh, maybe, maybe lousy uh, was a too strong no, of a term. No, it, it was probably the very accurate. The systems, well. No, let me I, just, I let, before you answer the question, let me just make this point to you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm concerned that, you, that, you, that we may be trying to, to judge the systems based on, you know, maybe some are better than others, like the comment, reasonably good job, may be reasonably good compared to a terrible job. So, and compared to a terrible job, it's reasonably good, but it's still bad. And I guess really what I want to ask you is, um, when you have, um, you're doing your job, you have a certain amount of resources and, and you use your resources. Your people don't work from uh, uh, just typical eight hours days, they work pretty hard. It's my understanding. So I, I'm convinced you all work pretty hard. But I'm also convinced that we have uh, a real cesspool out there of badly run public housing authorities. And um, I, I felt one of the problems that you had was that you simply did not have enough people. But you're, you're suggesting something even more di difficult, that the record keeping is bad. And if the record keeping is bad, it means people can really rip off a system and they'll never even be held accountable. Is the record keeping bad, one, at HUD, as it relates central and district, as it relates to the public housing authorities, number one, and when you look at the local public housing authorities, are their systems, record keeping systems, pretty bad as well? To answer your latter question, the, the systems at uh, Philadelphia and at Washington thus far have not been good systems. Uh, and we are having problems getting information out of those systems. Mr. Marmarella said earlier that uh, the 4,500 units that had been demolished, um, there's no clear record of. Um, in Washington, D.C., uh, our survey disclosed that they don't maintain a listing of contracts that have been let, or they haven't been able to furnish it to us yet. Um, in my mind, if there was a, a, an effective system, uh, that listing should, could have been furnished the first day that we arrived on scene. Um, your initial question was on the HUD systems. Let me just um, review that one last thing. Are they able to account for all their expenditures? We've uh, just finished our survey work and we have identified those areas where we are going to do detailed audit work, detailed testing, uh, which will culminate in an audit report similar to that that we issued on Philadelphia. And, and we haven't reached that stage to draw to okay. draw our conclusion yet. Okay. How about the central office? The central office of HUD, uh, there's, there's been a number of moves that have been made over the last three years to upgrade uh, its systems to come up with integrated financial management data systems. If you recall, we testified back before this committee approximately two and a half, three years ago on the Robin HUD scandal. And, and at that point in time, I think we mentioned that uh, HUD did not have adequate automated systems to catch instances like that. We recently did, completed an audit, which, which Mr. Greer could go into more detail if you would like, um, on the system that the department developed to address that situation, the Robin HUD situation. And we found that they have developed a very effective system in that regard. What, what HUD needs to do is move <coughs> into each of its programs and have uh, current information systems, which would then allow uh, the HUD staff, whether it be at headquarters or whether it be at field offices, to do remote monitoring with, with performance indicators of using data that had been submitted so that they could pick out the high-risk participants. HUD does not have that capability now. They need to move to that, to have an effective uh, monitoring techniques and effective systems. Okay. I'm left with the impression from having read testimony before today and uh, just even the brief amount of comments I've heard from the both, of, both of you that uh, we have a pretty bad situation out there. Uh, that uh, when you look at it you're, you're not pleased with what you're seeing and uh, that uh, it, we may find it's even worse as you, uh, as you get into these other 11 eight, um, housing authorities. Is that, uh, uh, is that uh, an impression that I shouldn't have? No, I think that's a correct impression. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Makeley. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to follow up on my original questions about the uh, uh, salary arrangements, the what appears to be excessive uh, staff administrative function levels, uh, what seems to be an excessive contract awarding process which is duplicative 
of other employees, uh, what seems to be an excessive total number of employees. According to your report, uh, you say salary and employee benefits for the additional staff cost approximately $14.8 million annually, and these would be staff above what is recommended by HUD. Did you look to see whether this is a vehicle for political payoffs, for political patronage, for political uh, gain for people, either at the city, state, or federal level? Mr. Marmorello will have to address that. I'm speaking now of the Philadelphia, yes. uh, the Philadelphia yes. Housing Authority. What do you mean, just for Philadelphia? Just for Philadelphia. Yes, based on our discussions with the number of uh, managers and employees at the Philadelphia Housing Authority, it became evident to us that uh, even some of the line supervisors were not real pleased with the qualifications of the people who showed up for work certain days. Uh, basically, we found that there was a serious problem, particularly in the maintenance area where people were hired to do general maintenance and found out they really couldn't perform that, then they had to contract the work out. So yes, uh, there, there, there are those indicators. And recently, the City Chamber of Commerce uh, reached a, uh, released a report on their review of the city that found much of the same. Well, who hires these people? And who actually lets the contracts? Basically, the, uh, the, the executive offices of the Housing Authority would have the authority to hire and fire, and the Board of Commissioners would have the ultimate authority of uh, approving con contract awards, major contracts. What about the under $10,000 limit? That would remain with the authority of the uh, executive director and his deputies. And uh, <coughs> did you find any relationship? I mean, who, was it just benign negligence in appointing people who are unqualified? I mean, aren't there standards? And if they don't follow the standards, uh, who approves them? That was one area where the, the efforts of the Housing Authority to have position descriptions and to have duties well defined was pretty much lacking. And it's an area that HUD has been after them to improve performance standards and job position descriptions. Uh, they were very vague. So is it fair to conclude from your statement that, uh, that you found evidence uh, perhaps indirect, that, that this was not exactly, not only a well-managed organization, but that there were influences from external sources? Yes, that's correct. And did you conclude what those external sources were? Not specifically, uh, just in general terms. And what were those general terms that you concluded? Political patronage. Ward from leaders, committee members, things like that. And how would these people get their jobs from ward leaders, committee leaders? I have no idea. Though. Did the Inspector General uh, look at these contracts, the 257,000, and to try and figure out how were they awarded in cases of that one which was $9,999.99, which sort of ought to set off a red flag? Yes, there was no documentation other than to say that it was necessary and needed. It we, we, we did look at the contracting procedures. Um, we did not look at every single contract. Uh, you know, the detailed testing for that would have, would have been an enormous job. But we found the controls over procurement very weak. Uh, I think the example that you're using of less than $10,000 um, is an excellent example. And, and we find instances at the federal level uh, where $25,000 is generally the cutoff where a contract can be let for less than that. That is a problem. I believe that report does contain certain recommendations for the Philadelphia Housing Authority to improve uh, those procurement practices. In the Philadelphia Housing Authority, did you find any evidence of organized crime involved in either contracts, employment practices, or the administration? No. Uh, in your observation of the uh, administrative practices, uh, do they have uh, uh, the ability to, uh, to improve, or are we going to come back here 13 years from now with whoever is sitting in these panels and uh, ask the same question? I mean, I find it just frankly incredible that, I mean, this is not a new problem. It's been going on for 13 years, apparently. And uh, 
as the chairman has indicated, this $350,000 or $250,000 contract which may be let to go count houses seems like a wonderful opportunity for people who are looking for summer employment. Uh, I mean, how do we get hold of this? I mean, you have a booklet that shows some facts and some ideas and examples, but when it comes to the, to the PHA's uh, inefficient operations, you give only two recommendations, withhold uh, a million four hundred uh, forty six thousand eighty five dollars and withhold one hundred and thirty three thousand there how do we get to the to the real essence of the problem there, there's a there's also a section in that report which um, I think I think you've what you've described is some of the frustration uh, that our staff that performed that audit uh, has felt who have worked on this particular assignment before. I believe an appendix in that report lists 37 previous studies, reports, audits that have been done by various agencies, uh, including our own. Um, those two recommendations that you're citing on the repayment of those funds is only an outgrowth of this particular effort. What we've restated in that report are our 25 previous recommendations, which are still open. One of the findings, I believe it's finding number nine in that report, talks about that Philadelphia did not have an effective audits management system. That system did not allow them, or, or they ignored that system, to address previous identified weaknesses, previous deficiencies, and did not take action. Uh, one of the things Mr. Marmorella hasn't commented on, and, and I think one of the conclusions we draw from that report, is that there has been uh, a large degree of staff turnover at the top or middle level management of that authority and although those faces change practices eventually reverted back to what they what they were um, so there are more recommendations uh, than just those two that that come out of that report um, and I think we have tried to get in some instances to the root cause of what we believe the problems are uh, I believe that, that the appointment of this special master uh, should go a long way in addressing both the conditions that we've identified in that report as well as those past recommendations that we've made. And uh, as I understand, there is an invest investigation on criminal activity. There's an ongoing investigation that's being coordinated with the Philadelphia U.S. Attorney's Office. No further questions. Thank you very much. What is your most optimistic estimate of the length of time it will take for HUD to be able to return to Philadelphia the authority for running? I think if they make some dramatic changes, um, starting at the top, uh, well, you are at the Come top up. now. I mean, HUD is at the top. Right. Right. But HUD has appointed this special master. I think the situation is laid out pretty clearly uh, what's needed to be done there. Um, I believe the special master is appointed for a year. Uh, I would like to think that significant progress could be made at that authority in the next six to nine months. Um, and that at the end of that year, uh, that authority or the special master uh, will leave. Uh, in order, are, you in prepared, order are you prepared to recommend that the special master stay on until in your judgment this swamp in Philadelphia is cleaned up? I think HUD has to have some direct involvement whether through a special master or some other mechanism until that is, until that is accomplished. Well, I want to thank all three of you gentlemen. Let me just say, we really have two clientels that we want to serve here. Uh, the first one are the people of Philadelphia, the low-income people of Philadelphia, who desperately need decent, and clean, and sanita sanitary and safe housing. The second clientele we want to serve are the taxpayers of the United States. Historically, neither clientele has been well served by the Philadelphia Public Housing Authority. That 
we have clearly demonstrated. This subcommittee will stay on this uh, task both respect, with respect to Philadelphia and other communities until uh, both of these groups uh, get what they so fully deserve. I want to thank all three of you for appearing. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Our next panel consists of uh, Ms. Margie Rose, public housing tenant in Philadelphia, Ms. Janice McCree, tenant and president of the Residence Council at Langston Terrace in Washington, D.C., Ms. Jean Stujewski, tenant and president of the Resident Council in Elvins Road, Washington, D.C., Mr. Kirk Gray, former regional director of the Office of Public Housing, the HUD Philadelphia Regional Office, Mr. Jim Feldman, former director of internal audit of the Philadelphia Housing Authority. Would you please all stand and raise your right hand. You solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to offer is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes. Please be seated. We're very pleased to have all of you. Uh, your prepared statement will be entered in the record in its entirety and uh, you may proceed uh, in any way you choose. We begin with you, Ms. Rose. I'm, I'm Margie Rose. C could I ask you, Ms. Rose, to pull the mic very close to you? A lot closer. Stop on. <laughs> I'm Margie Rose. And I'm a single parent of two children. My son, Kareem Rose, 11 years old. My daughter, Kimberly, 14. I become unemployed two weeks ago from a job that I hold for two years. I live in scattered sites, an apartment owned by the Philadelphia Housing Authorities. The apartment is located in North Philadelphia in a three-unit building. My apartment was a, my apartment has a kitchen, front room, and on the first floor. On the second floor, I have three bedrooms, a bathroom, and a hallway. Only two, two of the apartments in my building is occupied. The downstairs tenant passed away six months ago. It is not... It is now vacant. Okay. I have been a tenant in um, PHA since 1984. My first PHA unit was also an apartment in a three-unit scattered site building in North Philadelphia. The apartment was in terrible condition. The other two units was vacant and the pipes in the building bust. Within six months of moving and PHA transfer me to my unit that I'm in now. My concern of um, if 
if you would like to put this statement uh, in the record and uh, just tell us in your own words uh, okay, what the problems you. are with I'm your unit. Anyway. Well, anyway, since I've been in there, I've been uh, a tenant from um, 18, 1984, excuse me, I'm yes. a little nervous here. That's all right. And uh, I've been having problems since I've been in PHA from my other unit to this unit. It's like a condemned building. They moved me in this situation where I'm at now from a situation that I was in. It's no better than the first situation. And my apartment now is like from day one that I moved in, me and my kids. They promised me of repairs that I never got. I had this apartment for about a month before I moved in. I refused to move in it because of the condition that it was in. And uh, what, what are the problems with the unit okay. that you live in now? The first floor of my kitchen, uh, my floor is, is like, is real weak. There's wood coming up that you can see the other layer of the floor is before the tile, you know, the tile of what I'm in now. And um, my cabinets is rusted out. The, w the windows won't go up. They are leaning on the storm windows of the windows. You know, the storm windows is hanging on. A strong wind come past is going to blow it down. My bathroom that's going up the steps. My bathroom is like, is a hole leading from my unit to the other unit. And that whenever we take a bath or whatever, my neighbors can look right there in there at us. And by me stopping that, by putting boards up to the um, walls myself, I, I prevented some of that, but it's mildew, it's leaks, and everything still from the tub. And the, the floors in the bathroom is, is weakened too. And entering my daughter's room into the hall, you know, out of the bathroom, into the hallway, it's holes all through the place that have been there since day one. The front two bedrooms, right room is my son's bedroom. That the um, windowsill of his room is like you can see the bricks from the outside. It's been like that from day one. And that the windows is leaning on the storm windows have been like that from day one. He have no door up at his room at all. Never been a door up there since I moved in. And that's the front bedroom to my right. And moving out the front bedroom to my right is the front left bedroom, my daughter room. She have a door, but it, it don't stay closed. There's no way to keep it closed. And as it showed in the paper, a picture of a hole, like a three foot hole in my wall. That been there since day one, and it's like five other holes in her room that been there since day one that they never fixed. And her window in her room is the same as the first bedroom. And coming out of her room is my bedroom. It's um, the woodworks of all the rooms is rotten. The doors won't stay closed. My bedroom, I have a leak from when it rains, it rains in the inside. I constantly mop and have to keep clean. And I forgot about the apartment door. My apartment door entering my unit, uh, unit is dry rotten. I asked for a frame. You know, I went constantly to PHA. Matter of fact, I, I just became unemployed two weeks ago, off and on, taken off, with no business going to allow that to happen for an employee when they try to run a place of business. I constantly like took off, kept coming complaining to PHA. What would you, what would you estimate? How many times did you ask for maintenance? Well, I've been in, I've been in this apartment since 85, and I say at least over over a dozen times. I done been back and forwards down there. I done had two of my managers come out to the house, inspect the house, look around, write stuff down, and I never had anything done about my situation at all. And they keep, you know, nothing but promises. I hear nothing but promises, but me and my kids are seeing no results. We still live in the same way. The house is the way it is because I don't, I don't know why it is, but the way it is now, I done fixed it up the best of my ability to make it safe for me and my kids is still not safe. 
but I made it livable for me and my kids as much as possible. I done did my own repairs that I could do. I painted my own place. They never gave me any paint or anything. When I moved in, it was like as is, full of promises and nothing been fulfilled. We appreciate, we appreciate your testimony very much. Ms. McCray. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Latos and the members of the Subcommittee on Employment and Housing. My name is Janice McCree. I'm uh, the President of Resident Council at Langston Dwelling and a taxpaying citizen of the United States. Um, I'm, I'm coming with concerns about um, the housing situation at Langston Dwellings and for a citywide because I've seen some uh, places that look worse than mine. In recent months, uh, the vacant units at Langston has some has been renovated. The occupied units has nothing been done on the occupied units. My tenants are meeting me at the bus stop asking me when will their places be fixed. We have, we had burned out units that were vacant for nine years, some of them, nine, five years. They're finally getting um, renovated to a contractor called Tito. And they're not doing a very good job of um, securing uh, the places when they leave at night because we had raw sewage from one tenant unit uh, from the above un empty unit. They were supposed to secure and uh, people who were living in the, in the neighborhood got into the uh, unit and was uh, using drugs or whatever they were doing. So they, the contractors are being uh, irresponsible for securing these, uh, these properties in Langston Dwelling. The maintenance staff at Langston Dwelling is, I think we have five maintenance, but we don't have any skilled workers like plasters, painters, nothing like that. Our heating system is nil, is none. They have put two heating systems into Langston in the past, I say six years, and neither one of them worked. Uh, one, my unit, in my unit, uh, the heating system did not work upstairs, but downstairs it did. It was fine. And that was been about three, it was three years ago when they put it in. This year, it decided to come on. My radiator in the bedroom, through a miracle, decided to come on and bring some heat out. We had problems with the heating system on the first floor of some units being heated. The third floor, I mean the second floor, no heat. The third floor, heat. And the windows are like, just like they said, inst insulation is not insulation when you have ice inside in the winter and outside in the winter. The repairs are getting a little bit better since Mr. Sidney Glee at DPAR has been on the maintenance staff. He has uh, uh, responded quickly to our uh, demands, some of them anyway. But we have so many that no one, we would need about 300 people to uh, help us with our problems at Langston. How many units are there at Langston? They said 340 units. 340 units. We have, uh, as you know, Langston is a historical site. Yes. We have the additions, which they're in bad conditions too. All, everything in that complex is in bad condition. We're supposed to be on Mart of Mart uh, for 1995 or something like that. But uh, we can't wait five years because if we wait two, one year, Langston, as far as the bricks, that's being um, that is being eroded from the um, from the uh, buildings and the roofs that were not leaking before a contractor came in to do them are leaking now. Langston will not exist. Well, we want to thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Miss Jean Stujewski, who is tenant and president of the resident council at Albans Road. Will you please put the mic very close to you? I'm Jean Strzewski. I'm president of Elvins Road uh, Resident Council. I'm also the president of the Resident Council Presidents of Ward 8. And I'm not going to talk so much about my unit, 
because there are only 20 houses there. And they opened in 1985. And we do have problems. But the problems we have is nothing compared to the magnitude of problems overall in Ward 8. Now, I feel that as president of the Ward 8 president, since they are not here, I'm going to tell you, my um, grandbaby's uh, mother's godmother lives in Stanton Terrace. Uh, we've had the same problem Elvis Road. They come out and they put the screen doors on backwards. The woman is over 70 years old. She's a diabetic and feeble. She asked for repair. The repair was never done. The other day the woman came out and fell. Consequently, you know, they rushed that and repaired the dough. She has complained about heat. Uh, and they, they don't have heat in every unit. The heat has to be controlled from one unit for three houses. I, too, in my own unit, have had trouble with uh, heating and air conditioning. As a matter of fact, last year, uh, on July the 4th, the heat, the air condition went off. Call emergency service to get the air condition on. They couldn't do anything about it. I called several times to get the air condition fit. They come in there and do a little bit and leave. And no sooner the man get to the corner, the air condition was off. It's simple things like that that you have to put up with. Another time, I had problems with getting heat and complained and uh, uh, they couldn't give me heat. And the next time when I call, they say, well, it's after hours and we can't come out. I didn't uh, say anything to them because they had made me mad. And if I tell you exactly what I said, it wouldn't sound so nice. You might have to get the guards in here. I'm going to use my imagination <laughs> if that's all right. Uh, however, I did call Councilman Charlene Drew Jarvis on the phone. And you bet your bottom dollar, while she had me on the phone, she called him and told them she gave them five minutes to get there and turn that heat on and do something about it. Because I had an infant child in there. They did come. But uh, oftentimes, uh, I don't have a problem because this is the tactic I take. If they give me who shot John about doing a repair, I will call the council members. Uh, recently, I think it's been about a month, two months, I've been complaining about my kitchen floor was uh, sinking. They could not come in and fix the kitchen floor until Sunday before last, the kitchen floor sank. My daughter was visiting me. Her foot went through the floor. Monday morning when I called, they were out there. I have lived in public housing since 1943. I left in 46 when my father died. At that time, it was called Alley Dwellings. Eleanor Roosevelt established it for war dependents and soldiers. How we got in it, my father was 4F. It meant that he was flat-footed and he couldn't go in the Army. He worked in the Adjutant General's office in the Pentagon, so they gave him a unit. And at that time, we didn't know anything about maintenance problems. All oh, the houses was the nicest things you want to live in. Then Walter Washington became a director on the National Capital Housing. It still wasn't bad. But in the 70s, housing began to erode. And I have seen one problem after another. And one of the things that they did is if you got behind in your rent and had to go to court, they'd run in and fix your unit. And um, we got nails, and our houses are brand new, coming through the wall, up at the ceiling of the wall, coming through the wall. You need screens and um, storm doors. You can't get them. They tell you they don't have it. And one of the other bad problems is housing is inferior materials that they use. The government spends a lot of money wasting it by simple things of, they use inferior materials, unskilled labor, contractors that don't give a kitty, who just want to come out there and get the money and be done with it and go on about their business. And the next thing you know, this repair that they've done, they're doing it over again or they don't do it, complete it right. For instance, we uh, raised cane till we got fences put up. The fences were put up, but they're not put up properly. So therefore they fall down or the lock come off of it. 
We ask for uh, doorknobs. They don't have doorknobs. Well, I mean, how do you run a business that, where you don't have doorknobs because people have to get in and out the door? You have problems like that. Uh, uh, leaking tubs. Pipes that break. Railings falling off the wall. It's, a, it's just a mess. It's a mess. A real mess. And nobody seems, well, you know, Ray Price is doing what he can. But he's no magician. And I sympathize with him. Because he can't be a magician and by magically waving a wand do the things that have to be done. I have several tenants um, where I live whose flows are sinking. But of course they haven't had the good luck I had with my daughter's foot going through it. And they tell us they don't have the wood. They, they never seem to have anything. Paint. Well, we just got paint this year. They don't have paint. But do you really think you need a magician or do you just think you need a little bit of honesty, a little bit of competence? I mean, these are not, uh, you know, very complex problems, but they could be fixed if the people who did the job wanted to do them right. You don't really want to know what I think. I do want to know what I do want to know what you think. Well, I think now this is my personal opinion. I that's think that's what we want. What it's worth. Housing needs to sell the properties. Period. Because housing and I'm not talking about 1133 North Capital. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the overall housing doesn't give a darn because the federal government don't care. They are not going to put the money in there. They want the cheapest thing. Like, for instance, Frigidaires. You get a Frigidaire in your unit and a month later it's not working. They don't care. They'd rather waste the money doing the same thing they just did over and over and over again. I saw housing beginning with Walter Washington. They come in and renovate, and the same thing they've done, they got to come back and do all over again. Flows caving in and things like that. Because the money is wasted. Because they don't get the proper stuff, the best, the, well, let me tell you. If you're going to buy an automobile, you're not going out there to the junkyard and buy an automobile if you want something that's going to run. You're going to go get something that's decent, that's going to hold up if you got to put your money in it. Well, likewise, that's the way it is with housing. If they're going to make housing work, they've got to get material that's going to hold up. People that are really interested in making an honest dollar, and, and I'm not going to put it all on housing and management, and tenants that are going to take care of it. That's why they sell it to tenants to take care of it, because it's theirs then. I'm sorry. Well, uh, I, I think you're in good company because Jack Kemp is recommending exactly what you're recommending, that uh, these units should be sold. Well, I think these rents that they are taking, instead of taking the rents, because they got people in there, these supposed to be low-income houses. They got people in housing that are not low-income. Let them buy the units. If they want to live in housing, let them buy it. And also, frankly, I got your attention now, and I'm going to say it integrate it. It'd make a hell of a lot of difference if you'd integrate housing. Because naturally, all black poverty area, it's a difference. And I just have to say, I'm 61 years old, and I know at my age, ain't nobody gonna beat me. So I'm gonna tell it like it is. Washington, D.C. is a prejudiced place. And that's why the money is not there. They don't, they're not gonna do that to the other people. You know that. For what it's worth, Daddy. I got a grandchild that's got to come up, and one day she might live in public housing, and I hope it'd be a difference when she lives in it than what she's living in now. We, we very uh, much appreciate your testimony, and we very much appreciate your candor and honesty. I left a, a copy of my statement with uh, we're gonna, Adler. We're going to put it in the record. We're going to put it in the record, and we appreciate your being here. Next, we will hear from Mr. Kerr Gray, former regional director of the Office of Public Housing in the Philadelphia Regional Office. Uh, Mr. Gray, your statement will be entered in the record. You may proceed any way you choose.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to, be, to appear before you today. At some risk to myself, I'd like to begin by quoting from Will Rogers, the American humorist and philosopher, who once remarked that Congress has got more fiction in it in a day than writers can think of in a year. Today, I will attempt to provide the Congress with some very clear facts regarding HUD's management under Secretary Jack Kemp, as well as the management of the Philadelphia Housing Authority. In addition, I will offer several specific recommendations for this committee to consider as it goes about its very important deliberations. As you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, I served as the Regional Director of the Office of Public Housing, Philadelphia Region, during the period 1984 through July of 1988 and again for a brief period from May of 1989 until December of 1989. During the period July 1988 until May of 1989, I served as the program advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Public and Indian Housing, working on a series of priorities for the department, most notably the conversion of public housing to resident management and ownership, and the deregulation of the public housing industry. In addition, during my one year in Washington, I coordinated the internal HUD reviews of the various HUD regional offices. I left the department in May of 1990 to once again return to the private sector. I am the founder and president of the Gray Group, a small business social investment corporation based in Maryland. I will commence my testimony today first with HUD and its ability to effectively ensure that the tax dollar that we've heard so much about today is invested in the, in the delivery and maintenance of the particularly valuable resource that is public housing and that that tax dollar is well spent. These initial remarks are solely focused on HUD and then I will proceed with the Philadelphia Housing Authority. I would like to s paraphrase Will Rogers once again and state that the American taxpayer has come to feel the same about HUD as we do about a baby when he gets hold of a hammer. It's just a question of how much damage the baby can do before we take it away from him. Before the committee obtains the wrong impression, there are many very talented, very committed public servants working at the department, in spite of a paucity of encouragement and discipline, who still try to do the very best job to their abilities. I would like to also state that what has prepared the public mind for reform is less the relatively superficial and undisciplined management approach of the secretary and more the extraordinary cost of the delivery of decent, safe, and sanitary affordable housing that we've just heard about today. Let me highlight a quick example, if I may, because it pertains so much to the most recent testimony. And although it doesn't directly involve the city of Philadelphia, it most specifically directly involves a management emphasis of the secretary of this department. One of the secretary's highest priorities Indeed, he has presented small laminated cards to all folks who work in the Office of Public Housing throughout the country, which contains this priority, is that of resident management and ownership of public housing. Indeed, in 1990, HUD created an entirely new bureaucratic structure for this priority, including a high-profile, highly paid position of Deputy Assistant Secretary for Resident Initiatives. The cost of supporting these positions alone particularly since many of them have now been strategically created as career positions and thus cannot be sunsetted when their respective usefulness to the taxpayer is exhausted, is several hundred thousand dollars per year. Or in simpler terms, equal to the cost of enabling this lady and 20 public housing families residing in Philadelphia or the district to become bona fide homeowners each and every year. Though no one should ever disagree with the engagement of HUD, public housing authorities, local governments, and to the extent possible, the private sector in producing a climate of opportunity rather than separation for the residents of public housing. This particular priority has in it the parable for what is still very, what is still awry with HUD's focus and thus why at least in part, the bad and the ugly parts of public housing continue to impoverish the tax dollar and impoverish our, the, the residents of public housing. Secretary Kemp has long placed much stock in the use of, of, the, of examples such as Kenilworth Parkside, Carr Square, and other communities as a statement of effective policy making. However, for an example to be useful, it must be grounded in reality to, and to the practicalities of life. Kenilworth Parkside rests about 135 miles to the south of Philadelphia, and it is the first resident management corporation-owned public housing in the country. 
Over and over again, this development has been paraded and held up as an example of how to effectively turn public housing around. The price of resident management ownership at, practice at Kenilworth Parkside, when all the various subsidies are added, coupled with the loss of more than 200 public housing units for a period of longer than six years, while a waiting list of several thousand families and homeless in the district existed, thus denying public housing to a minimum of 800 folks, is staggering. Indeed, this model now costs more than $100,000 per unit, yet the city still receives no tax base from this example of privatization. <clears throat> Public housing is really a fairly simple and straightforward enterprise, or at least that was Congress's intention during the formative years of 1934 through 1937, when the basic policy of housing not as an entitlement program but as a program of need and focused resource was enacted. Along the way, during the past half century or more, a number of well-intentioned policies have been implemented, many of which have caused public housing to be a tremendously expensive proposition in terms of administrative cost, particularly in the urban centers of this nation. Mr. Kemp's effort at restoring public housing as a resource are equally well-intentioned, I'm sure, but are doomed to failure without broader insight and more capable assistance and far more comprehensive analysis of the true causal factors. Let me explain what I mean by the latter statement. About two years ago, in February and again in March of 1990, this committee held hearings on the abuses in the administration of the Passaic New Jersey Housing Authority. These hearings correctly focused attention on what was clearly evil and unconscionable behavior on the part of individuals who held a public trust. During the testimony, however, Michael Janis, General Deputy Assistant Secretary for Public and Indian Housing, stated that he felt it fair to say that the Passaic situation was the straw that broke the decontrol camel's back. Congressman Chase. I'm just interested, um, you have a, a very long statement and you're really attacking the Secretary, but I'm trying to relate, and it will be helpful to me, I'm trying to relate this to Philadelphia and D.C. and public house in general. Can you just kind of give me a theme as to what sure. the point of your comments are? Sure. I think uh, in the testimony which uh, details the entire management emphasis in part in the direction in which we are currently spending HUD money as well as HUD talent um, is incorrect. Okay. Are you going to read all ten pages no. of single uh, space? No, sir, I am not, okay. Mr. Thank you. I, he Thank went you, Mr. On. Chairman. Sure. <coughs> As a result of the Passaic situation, according to the testimony, Secretary Kemp immediately suspended the decontrol program nationwide in order to prevent further abuses. The irony is that Secretary Kemp replaced decontrol with a substantially more cumbersome and far less reliable indicator of management excellence, a large portion of this committee's hearing. A natural test of the management improvement made by the Secretary by suspending decontrol and instituting some 24 months later FEMAP the Public Housing Management Assessment Program, which is easy to manipulate by housing authorities, would be to examine what the Passaic Housing Authority's score of ranking would be if we applied that process today or back in 1990 when this, when this committee began its hearings on Passaic. The fact of the matter is the Passaic Housing Authority applying those scores would be considered a high performer under FEMAP and subject to and eligible for all the benefits and recognition of HUD under the FEMAP program. My grandfather, who came to this country in 1903 in the great wave of European immigration and established a base for my family in the, in the New England states, was often fond of saying that locks are only made to keep the honest people out. And I think that statement is particularly applicable to public housing administration, for regulations literally serve as locks, and we have un as we have unfortunately found, if a housing authority official, a HUD official, or even a member of Congress wants to violate or ignore the lock, he or she may do so with relative impunity for a period of time, regardless of how well structured the lock, or in this case the regulation is. Let me tie my grandfather's simple wisdom to the situation in front of us regarding the Philadelphia Housing Authority. And these pertain to some of the questions that have been asked earlier. In any large public housing authority, particularly an authority such as Philadelphia, as Mr. Marmorella stated in his testimony, with such a large and dilapidated scattered site housing stock, no matter how many HUD officials were available, unless an authority reports that units have been demolished or removed from the inventory, which they are required to do under law, 
then indeed HUD would have no way of knowing and thus no way of systematically decreasing or eliminating the, the subsidy that is given to the authority without that PHA notifying HUD. In this case, the LOC is a regulation which is the law which requires a housing authority and a housing authority certifies on an annual basis when it signs its ACC, its budget, that indeed it has X number of units in its place. And could, indeed I, could I just stop you on that point yes, for a moment? You worked in Philadelphia from 84 to 88? Yes, sir. Initially? Yes, sir. And what position did you hold during that period? I was the regional director of the Office of Public Housing. All right. When you assumed that position, Ms. Kirk Gray, uh, you, testif you certified to the number of units that Philadelphia had. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. I do review. I had signature authority on the budgets <coughs> with the regional administrator. Yes, sir. And uh, you did that every year thereafter. That's correct. Yes, sir. Now, during the four or five years, you had both the authority and the responsibility to certifying the number of units that were under your jurisdiction. That is correct. Yes. When I did, when did I you did you know of any demolitions and did you certify as to the change number of units Philadelphia had? There was evidence to us in 1987, um, two or three units that uh, happened to be in the public housing inventory that a small child threw a rock, hit the one of the buildings, the wall collapsed and collapsed two of the units. Um, fortunately, unoccupied units and we immediately deprogrammed those units. Uh, at that time. We also commenced, as uh, Mr. Connors in the Inspector General's testimony, a very thorough management review of the Philadelphia Housing Authority, building upon what the Inspector General had already done in 1983 and 84 um, to, find, uh, to find those units. And we inspected well over 200 units. Is it your testimony under oath that during the four years you were in charge there were no demolished units that were not reported to HUD? To the, to the best of my knowledge, with the system that was available to me, yes, sir, that is my testimony. Well, the key question is the system that was available to you. Mm -hmm. What was that system? Essentially, the system relies upon what is really a, the honesty uh, and the integrity of public officials holding a public trust. They hand to you a budget that states that you, that the housing authority has a certain number of units, in this case in Philadelphia, 23,000 roughly public housing units. That budget then is analyzed uh, line by line. Uh, detailed budget reviews in 1983 were proscribed by then Assistant Secretary Phil Abrams, that indeed we, you would not do a detailed budget review. That was the order that came out to all regional public housing directors, unless you suspected something strongly amiss. You then compare those those units with the data bank that rests in HUD Central as to how many units that the, that the department says indeed are there. They matched. Um, subsequently, then, you sign the budget, if you but agree the, with it. But the Inspector General just testified that HUD was paying on units which had not existed for decades. Yes, sir. I Do you think that his testimony is accurate? I would not say that the units had necessarily not existed for decades. I think the issue to me is if they had not existed for one year and the taxpayer had to pay for that, is the system at HUD able when there are folks who are either dishonest or corrupt or incompetent who, are, who hold that public trust, is the system able to catch them without the Inspector General? And my answer to you would be no, sir, it is not able to to corner them. Go ahead. Sir. Let me um, then state in terms of the, of the 495 units uh, which had been demolished without HUD initially, uh, without HUD approval. HUD could only assume that, as I stated earlier, that the authority had not violated the regulation and that those units were still in the inventory. One of the things that I would like to stay he say here, and it is in my testimony, that is that HUD needs to promote more opportunities uh, in terms of equward, upward mobility and economic uh, advantages for folks and create that climate. 
But it also, in order to do that successfully, HUD's got to look inward and, and revitalize itself, or quite frankly, discontinue as a cabinet level post, because it is not fulfilling the job that this subcommittee, I believe, intends for it to, or that in, is not the, the taxpayer intends for it to. There are three examples I'd like to bring to your attention which illustrate the state of affairs at HUD and why public housing authorities can find little other than occasional individual public stars, public servant stars, who are committed to his or her responsibilities to rely on. The first essentially is that HUD is, is substantially less timely than it has ever been in responding to public housing authorities. In part, that is because there is little accountability built into the employee performance system in the department, and that has not been looked at systematically whatsoever under any system of the HUD reforms. Employees that seek to protect the tax dollar and the taxpayer's investment in public housing by diligently working receive the same grades and the same remuneration as an employee who looks at public service as a paycheck. For troubled housing authorities, the required memorandum of agreement, which was developed years ago, long before uh, 1989, is of extremely little use as presently concocted and enacted. For example, in Atlanta, the memorandum of agreement is over 270 pages. I would suggest to you that anyone who is able to digest 270 pages is hardly troubled in their management system at this time. The Philadelphia Housing Authority's uh, Memorandum of Agreement is over 40 pages. These become dysfunctionally large documents and simply become paper chases in the system. The single largest cost to a housing authority, and we've heard it time and again earlier today, whether it's troubled or not troubled, is tenant-driven maintenance, the demand of maintenance, because that disenables or disengages even competent maintenance staff at a housing authority to perform their jobs effectively and get ahead of the issue. So that the issue of doorknobs, which this woman spoke about, or the issue of light switches, which should only cost five or seven or eight dollars to install and purchase, are costing in troubled housing authorities forty to one hundred dollars. Because it's tenant driven, the things aren't in place, they aren't inventoried, they aren't kept, and folks buy at premium prices. Finally, another example is that many housing authorities within the Philadelphia region, which is now responsible for overseeing, has always been responsible for overseeing the Philadelphia Housing Authority and the District of Columbia, now either hand deliver materials to the HUD office there, or else send materials, all materials required, forms, letters, responses to audits, responses um, to management reviews, via much more costly certified or registered mail simply because the consistency in which documents are lost or misplaced is staggering. There is, I was at a housing authority the other day in which the, there is a posted laminated statement dated July of 1989 that all mail sent to the HUD office in, the, in Philadelphia Regional Office must be sent registered mail or not sent. That's a costly and wasteful exercise. In all too many situations, I think HUD has failed as an institution and continues to fail to lead by positive example of professionalism, timeliness, and commitment. Let me bring up the final example in terms of, of uh, Philadelphia. The Inspector General has stated, and I concur with him, it was an astounding decision by the Secretary in 1991, considering the fact that the authority itself had identified that it failed the FEMAP indicators, the public housing management program that's in place under the secretary. The authority had never passed the relatively new decontrol indicators that were the subject of discussion in the previous hearings. That the secretary and I had stopped all CEP funding in 1986 because the authority had more than $51 million of unobligated CEP money standing loose out there, several millions of which were emergency funding, which are to be expended in 12 months or less, that the Secretary in 1991 rewards the Philadelphia Housing Authority with a grant that totals more than two and one half times the total amount of CAP monies that the authority had ever received in any single year. And indeed, $34 million more than the authority had done, ever requested. That is an unprecedented unheard of award of money. How do you explain it, Mr. Gray? I would have to, to state to you uh, that I am in disbelief. 
No management indicator whatsoever would give the ability of a HUD decision maker to make that sizable reward. And indeed, $84.7 million. Would you share for the record what your job was in 1991? What have you done since 1986 to 1991? Since, since 1991, sir? I have, I'm a private businessman. In Philadelphia? No, in uh, Columbia, Maryland. So do you have any personal knowledge of what was going on in Philadelphia? Yes, sir, I do. And how did you get that personal knowledge? Um, I'm intimately involved with Public Housing Authority Administration. Uh, and in I what capacity? As a consultant? As a consultant, yes, sir, as a consultant to both resident management organizations as well as to public housing authorities, as well as to the national organizations. And I've often been requested um, to give my statements relative to the Inspector General who has interviewed me on this issue uh, and to other individuals that are involved. If I may just follow up my, yes, my colleague's question, because you, you are in a fairly unique position of having served with HUD and now being in the private sector as a consultant. Could you give us a brief... Uh, job resume as far as it relates to public housing of for yourself? For myself? Yes. Um, the beginning of it would be fairly strange. I'm an anthropologist by training, um, looking at organizational dynamics. I taught for a while at the University of Wisconsin. I subsequently was hired by the RAND Corporation in Santa Monica, California. And that uh, involved me in housing in 1973. Um, in which I was a site monitor overseeing what later became the Section 8 and Housing Voucher Programs, the largest experiment ever conducted by the Congress in this country. Um, I subsequently held various posts uh, with other consulting corporations and um, research firms, uh, dealing directly with community development, working with the Appalachian Regional Commission, uh, developing innovative housing programs, and then I was subsequently uh, uh, hired uh, to become the regional director in October of 1984 um, and then subsequently left in May of 1990 to start up my own firm which I had left right before I came to the government. That's, that's really what it is. Yeah, so you served as regional director of HUD in Philadelphia for four years, five years? R yes, yes sir, in terms of total length of time about for four, public four housing. years, yes sir. And did you leave uh, on your own initiative? Yes, sir. I had chosen um, to leave on my own initiative. I had been reassigned um, by the department in, 1980, in December 21st of 1989 in a fairly interesting circumstance. On December 20th, I was the regional, I, I was the regional office of public housing director. On December 21st, I was asked to come down to Washington to have discussions with the Undersecretary for Field Coordination. Who was that? Edward Gardner, who subsequently left. Um, in those discussions, I was told that I could not return to the Philadelphia Regional Office. What was the There was no given? precedent prior to that. There was no indication. In fact, I had received consistently outstanding performance ratings and had won the Secretary's highest award, the Distinguished Service Award, in 1988. And what reason was given for not allowing you to return to Philadelphia? Well, my reassignment was to the Office of Housing to work with then Assistant Secretary Austin Fitz. And when I arrived and talked with Austin, who I had known before because we had done a fairly innovative thing to create some housing opportunities in Philadelphia, which did indeed create home ownership opportunities. Um, Austin was, in her words, glad to have me, but had no idea I was arriving. There was not an office or a phone number for me. And without a doubt, I took a substantial um, beating because of my opinions with inside the department. This is a department, quite frankly, gentlemen, that, ha that has a strong penchant against folks who are able to analyze and state their opinions. And it is a punishment-minded department. Ms. Gray, we would like to ask you to withhold for a few minutes while we cast our votes. Subcommittee will be in recess.
Subcommittee will resume. You were in the middle of your presentation, Mr. Gray. Thank, thank you, uh, Chairman Lantos. Um, first, I, I do want to add it uh, after such a, uh, a break that uh, I am in no way criticizing uh, Secretary Kemp. I am indeed critiquing and criticizing what I feel to be management flaws in the approach of the department which lend themselves to the situation in which all of us are concerned about in terms of troubled public housing and its effective uh, correction and management. I was stating that earlier that um, a large number of housing authorities within the Philadelphia region have now taken it upon themselves to, uh, which is paid by the tax dollar, uh, to send mail registered or certified in order to be assured that indeed a response within some time frame would, would arrive and that indeed the housing management representative had received it. In other regions such as Boston it takes as long as six or eight months for the HUD office to respond to simple management requests and by the time in which they have responded the situation is either worsened, has uh, remedied itself or indeed is irrelevant to any common discourse regarding the future or current state of public housing. Let me turn specifically to Philadelphia uh, and my observations of the, of the authority uh, based on my experience um, and my view from the outside at this time. After awarding in 1991 approximately $34 million more than the authority had ever asked for, um, the authority finds itself seven months later in a unique and relatively unprecedented or, or very few precedents ahead of, them, ahead of it, five or six of them in this country, uh, with a takeover by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. I don't feel as comfortable as perhaps some who will testify after me uh, that that should lend any reassurance to this committee or to the American taxpayer that indeed the job will be done correctly or specifically. One of the problems that lays ahead is indeed the same accountability that we apply to a troubled housing authority or a good housing authority must be held of the HUD office itself. And that responses that we demand of a housing authority in 15 days, HUD needs to be able to respond within 15 days. And, and Chairman Lantos, it brings up the incredible situation of having to issue a contract for $350,000 in the city of Philadelphia to count units. That is a loss of at least 10 houses in the city of Philadelphia for home ownership. That cost of that contract alone is a loss of at least that. That is a fantastic loss. In, indeed, the city department should, all, should be able, as you all have pointed out, to do that. I feel at this time that the, clearly the Philadelphia Housing Authority is incapable of conducting itself in a truly professional and business-like manner or to oversee the considerable resources for which it is entrusted. The authority oversees massive millions of dollars, equal or greater than the gross national product of several third world countries on a per annual basis. The authority is incapable of running its operation effectively, although some significant progress, I believe, has been made. It's also incapable of running it effectively and efficiently because it does not address it in a real estate manner, does not assign departments to run and operate as semi-profit centers, as business folks with a social conscience. The authority is beset also with enormous numbers of units, more than 100 years old in some cases, some are at least 75 to 60 years old in the scattered site inventory. Many of those units, quite frankly, gentlemen, were dumped upon the authority and HUD accepted those units many years ago into its inventory. Those units simply are dysfunctional public housing units and should be demolished. And indeed, if a 10-year-old boy can demolish one, I suspect that we could do a better job more rapidly and create environments for folks to own those units. 
The scattered site inventory is difficult to manage and presents difficulty to senior management in terms of staff accountability and inventory control and is in many instances is isolated from the very basic simple services that we all expect transportation, schools, health care facilities, um, other, other items that indeed are con that make it a community a community and make a neighborhood survive. My recommendation to this committee is that the scattered site inventory needs to be administered by a separate agency reporting directly to the mayor. It is an agency of 7,000 or it's an it's a inventory of 7,000 units which is greater than the no total number of units managed by over 87 percent of the housing authorities in this country. Philadelphia's elderly public housing also needs to be separated from the family developments and administered by a separate agency or at a minimum by a separate profit center of the authority held accountable by basic real estate rules of profit margin and service delivery. Unfortunately, in terms of a learning curve, these ideas are not new. Indeed, they were proposed as was a separate master for the Southwark project, which is in trouble, in 1987, 1988, and again in 1989 but rejected by regional, senior regional HUD officials and, and HUD central officials as too politically volatile to address. And now we find ourselves in the situation in which this subcommittee hearing is about. The authority has far too many employees and does not require anywhere near that number of employees to do its job. You don't need 1,700 employees to manage 23 How many employees years. do you think the authority would require? The uh, Inspector General has informed me that the authority has 1,700 employees. Yes. I, at the time of my tenure, it was around 1,350 employees. Um, far too many. The authority could effectively manage with 800 employees if they did their jobs. The Comptroller in 1986 of the Philadelphia... Yes, sir. Can I ask questions? Yes, sir. Your opinion, uh, or do you have any basis for that? There isn't a recommendation based on HUD standards in the IG report. How did you arrive at that 800? If I may, let me preface my remark by addressing HUD standards, which are equally as unscientific. Well, I'm just curious as to your standard. Yes. Is that scientific? I believe it is. It's based on a project directly across the street from, I believe it's Raymond Rosen, which has managed a similar number of units and is managed by 30 folks. And the project houses the same, the same income of people and is effectively run and passes all standards, housing quality standards. Whereas at Raymond did Rosen, I believe this is a project. My question is, did you just pick that number out or did you do some analysis? No, sir, I did not pick the number up. It was a budgetary number that was proposed in 1987 through an analysis that was done by myself Thank and my you. staff during my tenure. In conclusion, there's no doubt in my mind that the Philadelphia Housing Authority is and has been subjected to gross mismanagement over the years. Indeed, as recent reports have re-emphasized, the PHA has existed as a patronage burial ground, and it is only now that the buildings so long neglected have begun to scream, the residents so long witnessed to the problems of unsatisfactory housing conditions have begun to tr seek true resolution and the taxpayer to seek redress. The fact that HUD has stepped in, as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately in, is, is of absolutely no assurance that things will be placed in order. Simplistic approaches, such as resident ownership, actually do little other than to exhaust the goodwill and patience of capable resident leaders whom we've heard from today and honest travelers through the public housing who seek not to own a national trust that is public housing, but to move up and out and acquire a stake in non-subsidized housing. Let me just state there that in the city of Philadelphia, there's roughly 11,000 people on the waiting list. You have 23,000 public housing units. The average stay in public housing in the city of Philadelphia is close to a quarter of a century. Thus, 11,000 people are waiting nearly a quarter of a century to get into the units that we have shown, seen pictures of in the Inspector General's report. The system is quite frankly broken. I will end just with a quote from Mark Twain, and that is just to say that when Mark Twain learned of his obituary that had been published in the local newspaper in Hartford, he cabled back to the Associated Press from Europe that the rumors of his death had been greatly exaggerated. I will suggest to you, unfortunately, the rumors of the accomplishments of the management style of HUD at present have also suffered Mark Twain's fate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Gray. <coughs> Final member of the panel is Mr. Jim Feldman, former Director of Internal Audit of the Philadelphia Housing Authority. Your statement will be entered in the record, Ms. Feldman, if you could summarize 
will be happy to hear from you. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, good afternoon. My name is James C. Feldman. From 1982 to 1991, I was an employee of the Philadelphia Housing Authority. From 1985 to May 1991, I was the Director of Internal Audit for the Philadelphia Housing Authority. I have been asked to describe my knowledge of and experience in PHA. I am a 1975 graduate of New York University and I have a master's degree in management from the John L. Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. I am also a certified public accountant. From 1982 through 1984, I was employed by PHA as a management analyst and I designed and implemented management and maintenance systems, attempted to improve internal controls and resolve outstanding audit findings. Between 1987 and 1988, I served as acting deputy director of finance and was assigned to reorganize the records of the finance department to permit an independent public accountant to complete its annual audit of PHA. From 1985 to 1991, I served as the Director of Internal Audit. The primary objective of the Internal Audit Department was to provide information to assist management in carrying out its responsibilities in an effective and cost-efficient manner. It was our department's responsibility to identify areas in which controls were needed to help prevent fraud and abuse. We also performed reviews and investigations designed to detect fraudulent activities. I reported directly to the Executive Director and Board of Commissioners of PHA. In conjunction with PHA's management and the HUD Inspector General, I developed an annual audit plan which set forth an audit schedule and specified the areas to be audited. During the period of my employment with PHA, I was present for and observed a number of changes in the management hierarchy of PHA. Each year, PHA management would establish goals to improve maintenance, operations, security, procurement, financial and inventory systems, and overall management of the authority. Each year, however, despite the lip service paid to the establishment of such goals, PHA failed to develop or implement workable strategies to correct those deficiencies cited by either the Inspector General, independent accountants, or the Internal Audit Department. As Director of Internal Audit, I attempted to address the foregoing problems by developing both general recommendations and specific strategies as applicable, which would enable management to correct or improve those conditions I observed. Unfortunately, the PHA management demonstrated a marked indifference to addressing such problems. From 1990 until I left PHA in May 1991, PHA Chairman Jonathan Seidel and Executive Director John Payone not only ignored but also actively attempted to thwart our audits and investigations. My work at PHA ranged from the evaluation of housing units infested with cockroaches to conducting a detailed analysis of inaccurately or incompetently maintained accounting ledgers. During my employment with PHA, I learned or observed the following. From 1990 to my departure in 1991, the number of vacant units in PHA increased. In the year prior to 1990, the total number of vacant units declined 3%, from 3906 units to 3790. By the end of 1991, vacant units increased over 11%, and as of this year, they increased another 9%. There were no quality or productivity standards established for maintenance personnel performance. When my audit team monitored maintenance performance in 1983 and 1984, we suggested that a system be established and ultimately did implement a program which raised the average number of repairs completed from five per day to eight per day per maintenance employee. After the monitoring program stopped in 1984, 
performance returned to its original level. PHA never re-implemented the program, and to my knowledge, PHA does not know the number of outstanding maintenance requests or the number of jobs completed during a given period, rendering it virtually impossible to measure productivity. A recent audit noted PHA's seemingly inability to perform tasks as simple as repairing a broken window, and my own experience and observations confirm this finding. PHA has inadequate internal controls over equipment, tools, and inventory. Under Executive Director Gregory A. Kern, PHA established a central warehouse, but overall problems of waste, theft, and mismanagement were never addressed. Our 1990 audit of properties and inventories showed that 17% of randomly selected fixed assets could not be found. The PHA managers responsible for property and inventory challenged the methodology of the audit and the validity of our findings were confirmed by a PHA investigator who independently reviewed our work papers following the manager's protests. Despite the independent corroboration of the propriety of the audit, Executive Director John Payone and Board Chairman Jonathan Seidel refused to release the audit report. To this day, the report has not been released. PHA had no system of internal controls to adequately protect or even measure its multi-million dollar inventory of parts and supplies, which made it virtually impossible to assess the extent of shrinkage. When a theft of housing supplies was discovered at the Southwark housing development, the responsible PHA employees confessed but were never reprimanded nor disciplined. Following another maintenance employee's citation for taking PHA equipment home without informing anybody, he was promoted. The Section 8 program consists of privately owned properties subsidized by PHA. Our 1990 Section 8 audit report found that more than one-third of the Section 8 properties failed to meet even minimal HUD housing quality standards. The report also identified overstaffing in the department, costing in excess of $1 million annually in salary and benefits as well as poor administrative controls. Executive Director Payone and Board Chairman Seidel failed to take appropriate action to address the issues raised in the report and made no effort to ensure that the rest of PHA management responded to this report. They did, however, appoint an individual to the position of manager of the Section 8 department who was unqualified for that position, but whose brother happened to be a state representative. Mr. Seidel also reappointed a board member who was president of a nonprofit corporation receiving funds from PHA, a violation of HUD conflict of interest regulations. In 1991, I identified a potential conflict of interest involving the PHA executive director, John Payone. During a routine audit, I noted that PHA had begun to purchase stationary supplies from Market Street stationers. The records that we reviewed indicated that Market Street Stationers was not a supplier to PHA prior to John Payone becoming executive director. A review of several purchase orders demonstrated that the prices being paid for supplies were higher than normal retail prices. That an individual named Payone was identified as the contact person at the supplier and that the volume and amount of the purchases was increasing. I commenced an investigation into the ownership of the company and discussed this investigation with my internal audit department staff and with the representative of the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. By 1992, PHA's <coughs> purchases from Market Street stationers increased from approximately $1,500 in the year that Payone became executive director to approximately $72,000 between, between April 1, 1991 and March 31st, 1992. Market Street Stationers is owned by Peter Payone, John Payone's cousin, and is managed by Stephen Payone, Peter Payone's son. This relationship constitutes a clear violation of PHA's policies against the fostering of the appearance of conflicts of interest in its procurement functions. In late 1990, my department investigated a big rigging scam involving fencing and ironwork contracts with PHA. Overpriced invoices from two companies were mingled with higher 
forged bids from other companies to make it appear that competitive bidding had occurred. I advised Mr. Payone and Mr. Seidel that the individual in charge of the process previously had been cited for bid splitting involving the very same two companies. Mr. Payone's response to our reports was to fire one of my auditors working on the case and with Mr. Seidel promote the individual in charge of the procurement process in mid-investigation. Mr. Payone also instructed me to delete references to the promotion from my final report on the fraud. In 1991, I informed Mr. Payone that an internal audit investigation of a certain maintenance mechanic indicated that he did not appear to be reporting to work. Surveillance re revealed that the mechanic's PHA truck filled with supplies remained parked outside his home during the hours of his shift and frequently night and day. Mr. Payone did not respond to the internal audit report and took no action to address the problem. In 1991, my department conducted a comprehensive human resources audit of PHA, which revealed, among other things, the overstaffing of many departments, the hiring of unqualified personnel for unnecessary positions at excessive salaries, poor deployment of maintenance personnel, and an inordinately, inordinately low number of tenant employees. The foregoing conclusions, which we reached in May 1991, were recently confirmed in the HUD audit released on May 26, 1992. The Internal Audit Department's audit report would have brought these findings to light one year sooner. The report containing these findings was never released. As far as I know, as of this date, the Internal Audit Department Human Resources Audit has never been published. In summary, members of the committee, the Philadelphia Housing Authority is incapable of and its management indifferent to providing quality, low-cost housing to the citizens of Philadelphia in an efficient and cost-effective manner. The upper echelon of PHA's management is more concerned with the hiring of and contracting with political cronies, friends, and family members than the provision of economical housing. While top PHA officials posture and pontificate about making sweeping changes, experience shows that PHA continues to operate under the rubric business as usual. When reports of inefficiency, fraud, or waste are made, they are ignored, shuffled aside, or tabled indefinitely. This is true even today. While I applaud the actions of the regional director, Mr. Smirkanish, in appointing a special master to oversee the PHA operations, HUD's response to the problems at PHA is long overdue. PHA routinely reviewed reports of our department and it could easily observe PHA's limited or non-existent response to critical problems. Until now, HUD took little action or no action to address the problems discussed therein. The first step required for PHA to become a viable mechanism for providing low-cost housing is for it to begin observing the applicable standards of conduct governing the management of the authority and to have those standards vigorously enforced by HUD. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Feldman. And I want to thank all five members and we'll begin questions. <coughs> I'd like to begin with you, Mr. Gray, if I may. You're obviously a man of uh, great intelligence, uh, articulateness. And you held a very high level position with the Philadelphia Public Housing Authority. For about HUD. With HUD, I'm sorry. With HUD in Philadelphia yes, sir. for five years. Yes, sir. About five years. In retrospect, Were the problems that prompted HUD to take over the Philadelphia Public Housing Authority, were those problems basically present when you took over? In retrospect, I would have to answer yes, those problems were present. Now, you devoted uh, five years of your life to this job. 
how would you characterize the improvements that unfolded during your tenure? Am I content with those improvements after 20 years in public service? No, sir, I am not. Well, I'm sure Can you're I not content, but list them for me. Sure. In 1986, I suspended, um, to some degree against the advice even of the regional administrator, I suspended the total funding of comprehensive uh, improvement assistance program monies to the Philadelphia Housing Authority because of their failure for basic management capability and the fact that they had $51 million in unexpended federal tax dollar monies. One of the criteria for grading a housing authority at that point in time was how it could obligate and expend its money. And indeed, the criteria for, or including the criteria for expenditure, came out of Region 3 during my tenure of moving the criteria up to 36 months from an unknown number, roughly five years. If you can't expend modernization money, particularly emergency money, in, in three to four months, there's something seriously flawed with the institution. In any event, in that particular action, the $51 million became obligated and expended in less than 24 months for the Philadelphia Housing Authority. The emergency monies were indeed addressed. Were they satisfactorily addressed given their competence? Probably not entirely. And indeed, the obligation picture for the Housing Authority met HUD standards during that time. I would say that that action was a very effective but very high-risk action. I met with then-Congressman Bill Gray. I had to appear before the city council, um, uh, singularly pointed out for uh, jeopardizing the lives of residents for a first class city. And I suggested to the city council that a first class city doesn't not expend $51 million in a timely fashion, that that's something that a last class city would do, or a no class city. And indeed, the money w was expended. In addition to that, we implemented with the authority a series of HUD reviews that had, had not been taking place at the time. And I w also met with the Inspector General, and we both ended uh, working on two critical issues that I would also point to singular success, Chairman Lantos. One is that the removal of Anthony Ando, the former Comptroller of the Authority with the help of Mr. Feldman and other individuals, removed that individual from the Authority after he had received high recommendations from the New Haven HUD office and the New Haven Housing Authority, which we, we later found out that he absconded with money at that housing authority and also absconded with money from HUD. Mr. Ando is now serving a sentence in jail. In addition to that, the institutionalization and the encouragement of the internal audit department that Mr. Feldman so capably headed was l literally a partnership between the Regional Office of Public Housing during my tenure and Mr. Edward Marmorella, the Inspector General. Because we recognized that there were just tremendous flaws, seri such serious flaws that unless we divided the agency or created several new agencies to more effectively manage it, we were never going to have the talent or the person power to correct those flaws. And part of those flaws no matter how many regulations we pass or how many statutes, they go back to, I think, the point that the Inspector General, and I know the point Mr. Feldman emphasized and I emphasize in my testimony, they go back to the decency and honesty of public service and public trust. And if I choose to avoid a regulation, or if I choose to avoid a statute, or if I choose to be in a conflict of interest, quite frankly, there is little systematic that can be discovered of me under HUD's current management in, uh, assessment program for a number of years, perhaps. And I think we found this with the 500 missing units. After you, Would you yield be happy to you. Are you telling us that it's impossible to fi fi find 500 missing units, that you as a regional director and other people couldn't go down the street and look for 500 units? And we're not talking about a roll of toilet paper. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I mean, are you just saying, well, that's just human nature to lose 500 units? What, what triggers in you the idea to look at 500 units or 7,000 units in the scattered site inventory, and we did indeed find three or four units in a random sampling. 
Did we have the manpower to look at 23,000 units in that public housing inventory? No, sir, we did not. Did we have the technical wherewithal to do that? No, we did not. Is the American taxpayer supposed to be paying HUD and the Housing Authority to do the same job? No, is my answer to that. We found several units. We did not find the 500. The budget comes in. It's reviewed. We often do a random sampling of housing quality standards. And indeed, part of the effort with the Internal Audit Department was to help us internally to discover, because the management and the computer system, similar to the computer system in the District of Columbia as you delve into that situation, the computer system in the, in the uh, Housing Authority of Philadelphia in 1984 and 85 when I arrived was run the m entire modernization program, hundreds of millions of dollars, were run on the personal computer of an individual which was owned by the individual and not by the authority. You're looking at systems in place that have unfortunately, they're not systematic. Should we have inspected 23,000 units? I would still answer you no. I don't think that we had the wherewithal to do that. Could we have done things in retrospect better? Without a doubt. But the system that we were receiving enabled us to find three or four demolished units and get those de instantly deprogrammed. And that commenced uh, with us a random in of inspection of some 200 plus more units in the files and on site. That's a fairly labor intensive thing. We did not find any additional units not where the addresses were supposed to be. And so we came back. Yield back. You described uh, <clears throat> in a fairly dramatic way your transfer from Philadelphia to the head office. Yes, sir. You came here one day and you were told you can't go back. Yes, sir. It's a rather unusual procedure with a high-level official. What is your surmise as to why such a sudden and apparently arbitrary transfer took place? I would like to be able to say to you, Congressman Lantos, that it was in the best interest of me as a professional public servant uh, and of the department itself. My, I guess if I had to judge what went on that day, it was unprecedented um, behavior on the part of a allegedly honorable group of individuals. Well, describe uh, in a succinct fashion well, what I think happened that day. On December 20th, as I mentioned, I was the regional director of public housing in the city of Philadelphia. Yeah. On December 21st, uh, that evening, I received a request from Edward Gardner to come down and talk with him. He was, a, he was the undersecretary for field coordination in charge of all the folks in the field. I had not heard from the Assistant Secretary of Public and Indian Housing, Mr. Joseph Schiff, who was my programmatic boss on this issue at all, or anything uh, close to this. I had not also heard from Austin Fitz, who was the Assistant Secretary of Housing, and unfortunately at the time, HUD has corrected this now, at the time you had two masters on programs. You had one for housing, which handled the Section 8 program, and one for public housing. So you have two reporting systems going on, and essentially two programmatic uh, bosses. Uh, and I arrived at the time, ironically enough, of the HUD Christmas party. Um, so folks were fairly uh, uh, busy at making Christmas preparations. And I waited for about two hours to meet with Mr. Gardner uh, on a scheduled appointment at 9 a.m. in the morning. Um, had no real idea what the appointment was about. Um, and then subsequently uh, was unable to see Mr. Gardner and he uh, directed his deputy at the time, Richard Allen, to meet with me. Um, Mr. Allen discussed uh, with me that I was not to return to the city of Philadelphia, that indeed uh, I was on a permanent detail and permanently reassigned, and that indeed I could not collect my personal belongings in the city of Philadelphia in my office. Well, what reasons, All records, what reasons were given for these? I have uh, a strong suspicion that... Uh, well, the, before, you get, before we get to your suspicions... What reasons you, were, was I given? You, you obviously asked why. Isn't that sure. true? Yes, sir. And what was the answer? 
um, that the department felt that Ms. Ms. Austin Fitz, who at the time was the Assistant Secretary for Housing, um, had requested my services. Yeah, but that does not that does not explain what I can only describe as indentured servitude. I mean, you sure. know, you, you, you are told not to return to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. You are told you can't collect your personal belongings. Um, this is not an ordinary transfer. Without a doubt. It so you asked, why are you doing this to me? Right. And, and they said? They said that they chose not to discuss it, that when Mr. Gardner would be available, he would meet with me. I attempted to get hold of the Assistant Secretary for Public Housing. I also attempted, and subsequently, several days later, did have a meeting briefly with him. And his statement was to me, yes, I heard that you were removed from Philadelphia. I also attempted... Well, what I'm trying to, to, to understand, and uh, this happened three years ago, so you have had a chance right. to, to reflect on it. And we don't want to go into any details, but I want to get a sense of what happened. Was the alleged reason wrongdoing on your part, or was the reason whistleblowing that was disapproved of? I mean, you, you had a top-level job for mm -hmm. five years, mm -hmm. and uh, you come in here for an appointment, and they tell you can't go back. Let me, if you would allow me to spend just two Two minutes on, on I think the yeah J the writer John McPhee talks about forming pieces of the frame, and I think it's important here because I don't want to appear as though I do not think that Secretary Kemp is an honorable individual. I think he is often le served less by some of his uh, folks who are currently on board. Yeah, I am assuming that Secretary Kemp probably didn't know about this. I am, a, so I, and I've always made so that I, uh, we, we are not assumption. discussing Secretary Kemp at all. I've always made that assumption. The, prior to my coming back to the Regional Office of Public Housing, I had spent an enormous amount of time and received uh, recognition from the White House on the f conversion of Kenilworth Parkside to resident home ownership. There are strong questions about the cost of that conversion and about some of the manipulation of information that is still going on. That's the subject of another I issue, but it directly reflects upon my level of knowledge at the time, which was apparently perceived by some as a dangerous level of knowledge. I had also received the high honor from the U.S. Agency for International Development requesting my services in an exchange for one year to go over to evaluate um, the Caribbean region as well as another region uh, that USAID serves. I'm a former Peace Corps volunteer. Um, I recognize the, the, the cross-fertilization that can occur between HUD. Often we don't learn enough from our international experience in terms of shelter housing. That which would have normally for someone who received Distinguished Service Award by the Secretary would have normally been automatically approved unless you, you were felt to be so needed because of the urgencies in your former position as regional director. At the time, I was a program advisor to the assistant secretary. That was denied after two weeks with no explanation, automatically denied. I then returned to the city of Philadelphia and commenced again as a regional director of the Office of Public Housing. And it wasn't until December 20th that I understood that I was to be coming back down to Washington and I had no idea, I didn't know what job I was going to have. I later became, because of then Deputy Assistant Secretary Ronald Rosenfeld, his program advisor on the substantial inventory that we need. I to have to, I have to, to ask you to abbreviate it because okay. we are really not interested in all of the step-by-step -step details. Okay. What I am interested in is what happened. And you're a very intelligent man, and you can give me a very concise answer. I would say to In you the five years that right. you had this top job in Philadelphia mm -hmm. for HUD, mm -hmm. were you getting any indications that somebody at HUD Central was unhappy with you? I would say that no, I did not receive any indication, either by the HUD Central office reviews of my office, or by anyone prior to that. And is it your view now that this abrupt transfer 
took place because of policy differences? It is my view that it took place because of policy and personality management. Okay. Let me ask one more question, yes, perhaps. Sir. After you left Philadelphia, you came to work at uh, the HUD central office here in Washington, and you monitored the uh, District of Columbia, uh, District of Columbia Department of Public and Assisted <coughs> Housing. What type of management system did they have at the time? It's probably easy to, resp to enumerate the types of systems that they needed. Um, I will share with you an anecdote. The very first computerized system, which took exhaustive <coughs> numbers of years to begin to implement and was old before it was implemented, it had been approved by prior to my coming on board. The very first computer system was <coughs> tracked the number of individuals in each public housing community who were age 17 ready to turn age 18 and above voting age in time for the, el the election um, in 1982, I believe, for then Mayor Marion Barry, and that report went directly to the mayor. That was the first order of the computer's use. Congressman Makeley. Uh, Mr. Uh, Feldman, uh, you were the director of the internal audit from 1985 to 1991 of the uh, Philadelphia Housing Authority, is that correct? Yes. Now, you gave us examples uh, from 1990 to 1991. Uh, as a director from 85 to 91, uh, did you find irregularities and problems and concerns that were occurring similar to what you've enumerated in 90 and 91? No, the problems that I found then were very different. And what were they? Well, for example, the, uh, there was the issue raised by Mr. Gray regarding the former uh, director of finance who had embezzled approximately $75,000. And uh, I collected the evidence regarding that fraud and worked in conjunction with the HUD Inspector General, which ultimately led to Mr. Ando's indictment and conviction. Um, another case that I had worked on was elevator operations fraud and what I had determined at that point was that the supervisor of that unit was not doing his job. As a matter of fact, he was not even on the site of the job. He was busy doing personal things during the day. There was tremendous overbilling. The prices paid by PHA at that time were approximately twice what's paid by the New, uh, by the New York City Housing Authority, adjusted for inflation. And furthermore, in conjunction with an investigation with the Philadelphia Police Department, it was discovered that a contractor had been using his own maintenance mechanics to destroy PHA's elevators and then bill them to fix those conditions. Uh, during, during this period of time, uh, did you report all of these uh, uh, examples of uh, perhaps fraud and abuse? Uh, and uh, do you think that they were, uh, was it received by the executive director at least? Yes, I reported all my findings and conclusions and recommendations to the executive director as well as to the HUD inspector general. And uh, Mr. Uh, Gray, uh, did you ever receive any of these reports or did you have any knowledge that during your tenure as the regional uh, director at HUD that these practices which were just enumerated uh, were occurring? Yes, um, I did. We, we learned of them through the institutionalization of the internal audit function which had been missing in the Housing Authority um, and that was a significant management effort um, I think achieved by HUD not without some begrudging by the city. And Mr. Feldman's responsibility was to report essentially to the executive director and to the chairman of the Housing Authority, but he also reported on these, uh, these graft and corruption issues to the Inspector General for Audit, Mr. Edward Mamarella, who then enjoined me in the effort to stop certain types of funding for the Housing Authority. So yes, sir, in that, in that manner I did. Now, uh, as the regional director uh, during that period in which uh, you were employed, was that uh, 85 
through? Um, October of 84 through 88, really. 84 through mm -hmm. 88. Uh, did you ever make the authorities in Washington aware of the specific extent of what was going on in Philadelphia? On the, on the two an examples that were presented by Mr. Feldman, the, uh, the gr embezzlement of $75,000 by the former comptroller, uh, Mr. Anthony Ando, uh, as well as the elevator operation, uh, yes, sir, we absolutely What about absolutely this, the, the general? Without uh, a doubt. Poor management, the high vacancy rates, uh, the uh, just uh, enormous back rent, which was not collected. Uh, did you ever make a formal report to the extent that someone in Washington would get that report and say this is a very bad situation? I reported formally to the regional administrator and I did indeed, w was indeed brought down on numerous times to discuss the situation in Philadelphia with the General Deputy Assistant Secretary or an earlier than that the Assistant Secretary Lindy Lindquist. Were any of those reports made in writing? Um, the regional administrator reports were indeed directed in writing. Yes, sir. I don't have any copies of them anymore. But you did explain what the nature of the problems were? Yes, and made recommendations in a memorandum format. We had, I think I mentioned in my testimony in 1987, I had proposed uh, to the regional administrator and had a meeting at HUD Central to divest the authority of its scattered site units and of its elderly housing and separate the authority in more manageable compartments and to have a separate master or executive director reporting simultaneously to the mayor and to uh, the regional administrator and thus to me on the South Fork project. Why None of those were heated. Why do you think that a special master was just recently appointed and it took five years from your recommendation since you apparently did make that recommendation, did you make yes, it, sir. you think, strongly enough that they understood the... I made it to the, to the best of my ability. Um, I articulated the problems in elevator maintenance, uh, thanks to the efforts of Mr. Feldman and his staff, and, and uh, the problems in housing quality standards. I met regularly with a number of the resident leaders, uh, Rebecca Washington, Corliss Gray, Nellie Reynolds, those folks. Uh, exhaustive numbers of meetings uh, well into the late into the night to get their issues and their and their comments and we presented those I think in a fairly strong and fashion to change it in, in Philadelphia is a politically volatile city regardless of which side of the house you sit on and that is why I think some things were not done and, and what were the political barriers that you're talking about I mean tell us in specific terms If the American taxpayer feels that HUD is independent and the civil service system is independent of political influence, it is not. The fact of the matter is, is that we had proposed as well the takeover of the D.C. Housing Authority well before it was taken over. That level did reach the secretary, then Secretary Pierce. That was turned down the same as the Philadelphia as being too politically volatile meaning that the media exposure of how could HUD not say that we're not in part at fault. It's time for HUD to say, yes, we are in part in fault, and to get about doing the business of correcting the problems. That's a real difficult step for some folks to take. Um, relative to uh, Mr. Feldman's statement about the political and uh, I believe your, your exact uh, terminology was uh, let me find it here, uh, page 7. The upper echelon of PHA's management is more concerned with the hiring of and contracting with political cronies, friends, and family members. Uh, is that part and parcel to the political barriers that uh, Mr. Gray is referring to from your ex personal knowledge and experience? Yes, I would agree with that. And uh, uh, is the uh, uh, hiring of friends and political cronies, is that a... <coughs> A, a generally accepted practice in the Philadelphia Housing Authority? Currently, yes. And has that been uh, part of the problem why many of the people who are hired are not qualified to do the repair work and why 99 percent of the units ultimately are uninhabitable? It's a very important reason why, yes. And is the problem then not so much, as I'm hearing testimony, that they don't have enough money? 
but that they uh, has been a uh, almost systematic way of uh, destroying any management techniques or any accounting practices which would permit them to efficiently and effectively use the money so that they could funnel the money into the housing units. Is that a fair characterization of what's going on? It's basically a fair statement, but as things get worse, which they have, it does now require more money probably to help get it back to the level. That is, it's a little bit harder as you wait longer and longer to take care of the problem. And uh, was there ever uh, in the internal audit process, I'm, I'm uh, frankly uh, mystified on this issue of how can we have 500 housing units? I mean, this is not, again, pencils and small items. I mean, we're talking about the whole unit, how these could be missing and no one knows it for so long. Uh, was it, there any attempt to develop a uh, audit process. Sam Walton used to go to every one of his stores all over the country. I would think that despite Mr. Gray's testimony that they didn't have the resources, it does not take a uh, Desert Storm 500,000 troop army to count 23 to 29,000 housing units. It's a drive-by, there's the, there's the address, there's the building, on to the next one. Did they ever try to do that? Not to my knowledge. However, uh, as I mentioned before, I had a scheduled audit plan which defines which areas are to be looked at, and one of the future areas on my program was to look at uh, what's called the performance funding system, which is part of that process, that is checking units to make sure that the basis for the subsidies is correct. Um, so that was something that was on schedule to be audited at a future date. I mean, it just seems to me that if you're going to go in and do some audits on what the condition of the unit is like, you would probably want to know, is the unit even there? And so if you want to know, is the unit even there? And so if you start with an assumption that you don't even know if there are units, how could you ever get to the issue of, are they currently being maintained as an internal auditor or as any organizational employee. Did that ever get raised to either of your knowledge? I have not heard that issue raised before, no. If I may add to that, one of the re requirements under then decontrol and current and borrowed off of for FEMAP is that the housing authority is to annually inspect every single one of their units and to certify as to their conditions whether or not they meet housing quality standards, basic national floor minimum that's used in Section 8 and public housing. The Housing Authority consistently failed that measure of inspecting all 23,000 units. What we subsequently did at HUD is that we looked at several hundred units along with the Inspector General who took a sampling of roughly 100 and found that the conditions were so bad, so deplorable in 1986 that we stopped CAP and in 1980s, because you had so much money left there to, to address those problems, and in 1987 forced the Housing Authority to report us and set up a management system that the Housing Authority would report as to how many units they were inspecting. The problem is though is that the housing authority could certify and housing authorities throughout this country um, the ones who aren't terribly truthful still can certify under the current HUD system that they've inspected all of their units and get away with that. Okay. Um, is it Jean? Is this your Jean? Yeah. Jean uh, uh, I want to thank you for your testimony. And one of the arguments that has been made about uh, not permitting or not in, uh, developing a program of uh, people owning their own uh, housing units, particularly where they're public housing units, is that uh, people don't want to live in those types of units. They want to move out and that there wouldn't be the same sense of, of pride and ownership. Now, you seem to, as a president of a tenant association, uh, and as someone who has a lot of experience, you would argue you you would argue against that, right? Uh, I raised four children, three girls and a boy in public housing. And as I say, I lived in public housing as a child. Yes, I don't want to live in public housing as it stands now. 
That's why I like my little townhouse, even though I'm dissatisfied with it. It's why I don't want to live in public housing, because it stinks. The name public housing means you're poor, black, and nobody wants to live there. But why? Because the fact they're all gathered there together, even a rat don't want to be all gathered together like that. You know, like a lot of people uh, are in public housing or used to be in public housing where they had the houses, they were private houses that were uh, either sold to housing or rented out to housing and we were able to move in them. Yes, that's what I, I wanted but I never got one. But yes, people would take pride and interest in them if they were fixed up and made to look like private housing. If the same interest that you take in private housing was generated into public housing, uh, the stigma that black people were inferior, that they were goons, and uh, that they didn't have the same educational abilities as white. They couldn't do the same thing. Well, you see what a mess it turned out to be? Black people did overcome their handicap. They came from slavery up to lawyers, doctors, judges, you name it. Anything that people want to do, they can do. And I look at the people on my property. Yeah, there's some of them that's trifling. But there's some of them that takes real good interest in those houses. And, well, one thing my mother told me, she was my stepmother, and she told us, and I tell my children that, and I, my youngest child lives with me in public housing. The more you give a person, and that's what they say about welfare, the more you give them, the more they want you to give them. The less incentive they have for going out doing for themselves. I lived in Barry Farms 27 years. It was nothing to me to go out and buy five gallons of paint to paint my house. It was nothing to me to go to the hardware and get a little can of cement to caulk a hole before I paint it. I, uh, I wanted, my living room floor had been burned and it had been burned so bad till the black that was in it you couldn't get out. I went to uh, <coughs> Sears and got some wood tile and tiled that flow to the point that you couldn't tell it wasn't a hardwood flow. <coughs> so I don't believe it. What's so that? don't ask me because I don't believe it. Well, I, I just believe want it could be that people would take an interest in it just like anything else if it was made. And then where could you buy a house for maybe? Well, let me see. When my mother-in-law, she lived on Florida Avenue, and I'm going to try to see if I can give you a picture of that particular area. That's 11th and Florida Avenue, bounded by um, H Street. It's a, a very shabby neighborhood. Talk about public housing, some public housing looked better than the shack she lived in. They wanted $20,000 for that house when they decided to put it on the market. That's what they wanted. First they said, well, because she lived in it, they let it go for 10000 She didn't want it. Then they said, well, 20000 They sold the house for $65,000. It wasn't nothing but a shack. But they went in it and smeared some paint and put a new furnace in it, fixed the backyard, $65,000. Thank you very much, Gene. I know that uh, Secretary Kemp would applaud and, and agree with your uh, ideas. And I, I just want. Well, Tell me <laughs> like it is. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, if you all don't mind, I'd like to go because I got a young child that I have to pick up from school. We we very much appreciate your coming. You have added a great deal to our understanding. I want to thank you. You sure did. Really. Yes. Thank you. And very as much. I said, I want public housing to be better. So if my grandchild has to live in it, she can be happy and like where she's living. We so share, we you share like your, you your view and we appreciate your being here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. I just wanted to ask Janice and uh, Margie real, real quickly uh, whether you think that private ownership of these particular housing units would help. If you could just give us your quick thoughts. For us um, putting us in one? And having private ownership. Oh, I think that would be fine, long as it's, it's decent enough to live in, you know, when we move in, not like what I live in now. Janice? 
in some ways I agree with you, but what's going to happen to, if you sell all public housing, if you do one for one, if you sell one, you build one, that's fine. But where are the other people, the poor people going to go if you sell off all public housing? And some of public housing, I wouldn't even want to live in. I wouldn't even want to buy because the structure Langston is 50 some years old and it's a very well built uh, public housing. That's why it stood up so long. And I don't mind living there. I have a pride now in my community. That's why I'm out here now fighting for Langston to get back, not like it used to be, but even better. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Thank you. You'll be. Congressman Shays. I'd, I'd first like to um, thank you, uh, Ms. Rose and uh, Ms. McCree. I, I don't really have any questions for you because what you've done is confirm what the auditor has stated, that you live in absolutely deplorable conditions. So I don't really, I don't really need to go beyond that. I, I appreciate you being here and, and confirming that. I'd also say um, to you, Mr. Feldman, that uh, you basically back up the Inspector General's account um, that pretty much says that the Philadelphia Housing Authority has failed to provide decent, safe, and sanitary housing. In fact, 99% of the units were substandard. I mean, you know, not 9%, not 50%, but 99. Uh, that, that the PHA has over 4,500 vacant units. Um, whatever, you know, I'm told there's just no excuse for that, and no one in the position of you, Mr. Gray, uh, should have had it go beyond you, and uh, I want to get into that, um, that repairs were not done timely. Timely, they weren't done in months, in years in some cases. Uh, that tenants owed uh, a lot of money, 6, 6, over 6.5 million, but let me tell you, if I was a tenant, they wouldn't get my money. Um, that the PHA's overall financial position is deteriorating, that's a joke. Uh, deteriorating, it's, uh, uh, it, 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 this is a corrupt organization. Uh, if, if we're to believe the, the Inspector General and uh, Mr. Feldman, if we're to believe uh, even half of, of your comments, which I do believe, uh, this is a corrupt organization uh, that needs to be cleaned out from top to bottom. And uh, we'll be asking the Executive Director when he comes in, uh, you know, how he responds to some of the charges that you made. Um, receiving operating subsidies for over 400 buildings that don't exist uh, units, they're just, uh, you know. So, um, Mr. Feldman, I thank you for your testimony. We will follow up on that. And Mr. Uh, Ms. Rose and Ms. McCree, I thank you as well. Uh, I'd just like to um, ask uh, you, Mr. Gray, some questions. Um, I, love, I love people. Should we vote? I, I'll take 10 minutes so we can do it before I can finish up, I think. Yeah. Mr. Gray, I just I, I love it when when people use uh, phrases, uh, you know, descriptions. You say um, with Will Rogers, who once remarked, "Congress has got more fiction in it in a day than writers can think of in a year," and I happen to agree with that. And I was looking forward to you providing facts, mm -hmm. uh, but I heard a lot of opinion. Uh, and a lot of anger, which I can understand, and uh, uh, you really went after the secretary, and I, you know, that's your privilege, and I accepted that. But then for you to say, and I am, I am in no way criticizing Jack Kemp when we come back after you've just done it, it makes me know, wonder if you know if red is red and white is white and black is black. I mean, you, you have it in your, in your statements. Just one statement, what has prepared the public mind for reform is less the relatively superficial and undisciplined management approach of the secretary. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's not a criticism. You're, you're free to make it, but don't tell me you're not criticizing him. I am criticizing the approach and not the man, and there's a fine difference So you like him as a person, him. but you just think he's incompetent. I'm saying that the approach is, quite frankly, ill-conceived. And you think he's superficial. I think the approach is superficial. Okay. And that is a not doubt. a criticism? 
Let me, if I may give you no, one example. No, I just example. want to know if that's a criticism. It's certainly not a compliment. You are free to say anything you want, mm -hmm. but just don't tell me that you're not doing something that I listened to for, for more than 20 minutes. You went mm -hmm. right after him. That's fine, but don't I, tell me afterwards that you didn't criticize him. I would, I would disagree with you. I went right after the approach that's currently in there, and I'm, tr I'm attempting to inform the subcommittee not only of my opinion, but I think I gave a fairly long delineated list of examples. Well, let me, that, let, let me I, just go I back. Finish? No, no, I'm just going to go back after this question. We have to get beyond this, and right. once we get beyond this, then you can give me your very long answers. Fine. What has prepared the public mind for reform is less the relatively superficial and undisciplined management approach of the secretary. I want to know if his management approach, approach is undisciplined. Yes, it is. Is it superficial? Yes, it is. Okay. So as far as you're concerned, uh, and, and that's not a criticism? Not of Secretary Kemp, but of the well, Who is it? As criticism of, 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 of um, uh, the president? Who's, who, who are you criticizing? I, I think you're talking about the secretary. If I say to you right now that your questions, I think, are misinterpreting what I'm saying, is that a criticism no, of you? No, if but you, if you said that I was superficial and that as a manager I was undisciplined, I'd, I'd say that was a criticism. I'd like to come back. If, if my friend will yield, I think the approach is that of uh, hate the sin and love the sinner. Okay. Uh, we will be in recess for a minute. Why was he ever set up to do that to me, huh? Subcommittee will resume. We'll continue with Congressman Shays. Mr. Gray, before we went off to vote, you wanted to make a comment, and I interrupted you. Did you want to make any comment before I ask you any more questions? Um, no, sir. Uh, please, go ahead. Um, I, the, the reason why I focused in on whether or not you were questioning, uh, criticizing the secretary wasn't that uh, you don't have the right to do it. I just was trying to look for the purpose of it. And, um, and also, I was determined to ask you the question when you said after we came back from one of our votes that we were in no way criticizing him and just made me wonder if I'm going to be able to rely on your answers if we can't even agree on something you said uh, before this committee. Uh, but that's the reason why I asked you the question. Uh, I guess what I really want to go to now is, is just understanding your responsibilities. You were the regional director of the Office of Public Housing for the regional office of, of HUD? That's correct. How many states did that include? There were five states and the District of Columbia. Okay. And was Philadelphia the most, uh, the largest district, the largest public housing authority that you had? Uh, it was the largest, it's the fourth largest public housing authority in the country okay. and the largest in that region. They have over 80,000 residents and over 23,000 units and so on, so it's a pretty big unit. Um, it, it was on the trouble list from 1979 up to this point, and uh, one of the things that amazes this committee is that, that it wasn't taken over uh, sooner. Mm -hmm. um, I'm amazed why it wasn't taken over during your watch. Mm -hmm. And let me just ask you this. You criticize the local public housing authority, which is Philadelphia, and rightfully so. You criticize Washington HUD. Aren't you somewhere along that continuum? I mean, don't you have any responsibilities for what happened here? Without, without a doubt, I would say that I am indeed in that continuum as a public servant holding a very high public trust. I would say to you, though, that we had proposed and in numerous meetings, not all the things that are performed at the department, as I'm sure inside of your committees, not all the things are recorded in writing. There were numerous meetings about troubled housing authorities. In fact, I served on the early on a national council on troubled housing authorities that was called by HUD. And Philadelphia, as to the approach of taking it over, um, 
what did that mean? Is HUD capable of assuming the reins? What are better alternatives um, in terms of approaching it? Can we get at it by going after the microcosm of getting units fixed up in a timely manner? And we tried to do certain types of leverage, one of which was a relatively unprecedented act of suspending CAP, which I did do in 1986. I, I, I'm not sure that was unprecedented. I said it was a relatively, there were only two or three other examples at the time in which a full-scale suspension of CAP, other than emergency monies, had been done based on management performance. No. You said you were a public servant, and I thank you for being a public servant, but you were the director. You were the director of the Office of Public Housing. That's correct. You good. weren't in charge of, of other things other than public housing, correct? I was in charge of assisted housing as well, okay. yes. Uh -huh. So basically your focus was on public housing. You had, I guess what I'm trying to understand is, was your job irrelevant and should we get rid of, of, of directors of Office of Public Housing and just go directly from public housing to Washington, or did you have a role to play and do you have any suggestions for people maybe who take your place that do something different? This was not an, an agency that was on the borderline of being mm -hmm. bad. It was bad in every sense of the word. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are told from our reports that almost every unit was below standard. We're told that they were given uh, money for hundreds of units that didn't even exist mm -hmm. and that they were given money for thousands of units that weren't even occupied and it happened as well when you were there and somehow I find it somewhat offensive that you find the problem there and you find the problem here but somewhere along the line you're irrelevant to this process and it, I'd like to know wh where you were relevant. Sort of the eternal question. Um I no, would it's a say basic, to you, it's a basic question for me to get the facts mm -hmm. rather than to be confused, which you don't want me to be, at mm -hmm. least by your opening comments. The level of authority that I assumed as the regional director of public housing was the following. I could instruct staff and, uh, and assign staff, given the number of staff that one is, is given in terms of the appropriations for staffing, to direct their energies at troubled public housing or at good public housing so that we could learn something from those. Congressman Lantos earlier asked about some examples of good public housing, and there are many. Number two, I had the authority to recommend, and subsequently it was later assigned to me, to recommend the approval of the authority's budget, and I would recommend that to the regional administrator in whom the, that power was delegated by the secretary. Could I just interrupt you there for that uh -huh. point? Basically, for Philadelphia to have gotten all that they got, it had to go through your desk. You had to make those recommendations. Without, a, without question, yeah, sir. Without question. Mm -hmm. Everything that happened had to go through your desk. Mm -hmm. It didn't jump over to Jack Kemp's desk. You were not irrelevant to that process. So mm -hmm. tell me why, when it came through your desk, you didn't do anything about it. I would wholeheartedly disagree with you that I did not do anything about it. You recommended that they get these funds, that they get their operational funds, that they get funding for units that didn't even exist. Regardless of my recommendation on the operating funds, they would receive the operating funds. Uh, okay, now explain that to me. So, you did The operating have budget is structured so as to compensate for the lack of revenues generated by what should be expected under rent collection to make the units routine maintenance to pay for staff, those types of things. And it's, a per it's called a performance funding system. No, and it is automatic and beyond my control. It's a formula funding system. No, uh, uh, that's, that is somewhat misleading, I think, to say it's beyond your control, because you have the ability to recommend that they not get operating subsidies based on the fact, not that they had 10 mm -hmm. or 15 or 20 units mm -hmm. that, that weren't occupied, but that they had literally thousands of units that weren't occupied. Congressman, if, if I did not have the authority, I guess I, any person, even a junior level staff person to me, yeah. would have the authority to recommend we shouldn't be paying them Excuse to me, do this. Excuse me, you weren't junior level. You were the director of public housing. Right. If, okay. if I may finish. The, as a senior level 
director of public housing. I could not, I could recommend not to receive operating subsidy. The fact of the matter is, it is going, that housing authority is going to receive operating subsidy. Don't you think it would have been a good start in the process? No, sir, I do not. I think it's irrelevant to how public housing is done in this country, sir. No, no, no. It's not irrelevant when a public housing authority is ripping off the system and you're telling me that even if they're ripping off the system, you couldn't have done anything about it. Let me tell you what operating subsidy stops, if I had the power to stop it. Yeah. It stops immediately routine maintenance. It stops the internal audit process. It stops all heating to the, to the housing authority's well, it, projects. It may be, no, no, no. It does all those things, but mm -hmm. it also wakes up people to say, why would you be doing it? Now, one of the reasons you'd be doing it is that almost every unit in Philadelphia was below standard that people were ripping off the system, mm -hmm. that the housing authority was getting money that it never should have gotten.